Alabama woman was arrested over the weekend after she allegedly tried stabbing multiple people, vandalized a car, and set fire to an apartment with a woman and three children inside. The incident occurred around 9.30am on the 22nd of August. The authorities were called to the Parkway Villa Apartments, located along the 100 block of 14th Avenue Northeast Center Point, on reports of 27-year-old Lisa Grayson vandalizing a vehicle in a parking lot. When they arrived, they discovered a fire that had been lit in one of the apartments, and a man at the scene had been taken to a hospital by a private vehicle after receiving non-life-threatening stab wounds. Witnesses told the officers that Lisa had been arguing with the man when she attacked him with a butcher's knife. Lisa's roommate exited the apartment to confront her about the incident, but Lisa attempted to stab her as well. Lisa then went to the parking lot and vandalized the man's car using a cinder block. She then went back into the apartment where a roommate and her roommate's three children were inside. She then proceeded to pour lighter fluid and cooking oil throughout the residence and set it alight. All four occupants managed to escape. One was treated for smoke inhalation. Lisa's been charged with six counts of attempted murder, one count of arson, and criminal mischief. She's been held at the Jefferson County Jail on a $435,000 bond. 19-year-old Emma Presler is wanted by the authorities and has been charged with the murder of a man on the 23rd of August after allegedly breaking into a couple's home, pouring gasoline on them and setting them on fire. The attack occurred at around 10pm on the 6th of August when authorities were called to a home on reports of an arson attack located at 2046 Aspen Glade Drive in Houston, Texas. Upon arrival, they found 33-year-old Devin Graham and his wife, 26-year-old Carissa Lindros, outside the Scorch building, severely burnt and in a critical condition. The couple were transported to the Texas Medical Center for emergency treatment. A woman who police later identified as Emma Presler was seen by witnesses running from the scene and then taking off in a white four-door sedan after the incident. The next-door neighbor Jeff Wilson said he saw a man screaming in pain without clothes on and his skin peeling. At the hospital, Devon told police that a woman went into his home, poured an unknown substance on him, and lit him on fire. He succumbed to his injuries days later. Carissa remains hospitalized with 70% burns to her body, and is fighting for her life. Since the incident, she's had at least five surgeries, and has been suffering from numerous infections. A family member reported that Carissa and Emma knew each other, but didn't specify how the two were acquainted. The authorities haven't released a possible motive for the crime. This isn't Emma's first run-in with the authorities. In September of 2020, Emma was charged with murder after 20-year-old Sierra Rod was shot and killed as she slept in her bed. Emma was being accused of being the getaway driver. However, those charges were later dropped after a judge found there was insufficient evidence to hold her accountable for the crime. A New York man has been charged with attempted murder for allegedly stabbing a driver who took a parking spot and then insulted his wife. The incident occurred just after 5pm on Sunday the 23rd of May. 49-year-old Gregory Williams was visiting some friends and was looking for a parking spot. He then started moving a traffic cone that was blocking a parking space outside 58-year-old Anthony Thomas's house in Mentone Avenue in Laurelton, Queens. This enraged Thomas as he came out of the house yelling at the driver, saying he needed two spaces for the cars, one for him and one for his wife. Williams proceeded to park his car anyway, cursing back at him, saying that he doesn't own the block. Thomas then went back inside his home for a moment, and then came out with a 9-inch butcher's knife that was tucked in his pocket to confront Williams with. Thomas's wife then stood in the doorway telling him to bring his ass back in the house. Go back with your bitch ass wife, Williams shouted at Thomas, which sent Thomas over the edge. After Williams disrespected his wife, Thomas said, What was that? I need to hear that again. Williams then repeated at least three times as Thomas got closer. Thomas grabbed Williams' wrist as he tried to get away. He then held him by his arm and started stabbing him seven times in the chest, abdomen and arm, until he finally let his victim go. He left his victim clinging to his life while witnesses around him were screaming hysterically. The authorities were contacted and transported Williams to the Jamaica hospital. When the police arrived on scene, 
They found the knife used in the stabbing in Thomas's dishwasher, still covered in Williams's blood. He was handcuffed and calmly led away. Thomas's next door neighbor, 66-year-old Beverly Matthews said, Thomas was very particular about his space, and he didn't put up a fight when the police came to arrest him. He thinks of himself as the mayor of the block. Earlier in the day, the victim is said to have been drinking and smoking with the people across the street from Thomas's house and was returning to go back there. Thomas has been charged with attempted murder, two counts of assault, and criminal possession of a weapon. Williams was initially admitted to hospital in a critical condition, with a collapsed lung and massive internal injuries, but has since improved to a stable condition. 53-year-old Lee Bowman of Iowa has been arrested and charged with arson after allegedly setting fire to his next-door neighbor's house because they didn't mow his lawn. The incident occurred on Sunday the 23rd of May at around 5.57pm when the authorities received a report of a fire at a home located on the 3100 block of 8th Street in Sioux City. The neighbours noticed the victim's house was on fire and called 911. The neighbours banged on their door and the residents managed to escape unharmed. It was estimated that the fire caused around $3,000 worth of damage to the corner of the home. An investigation into the matter revealed that sticks and plywood were propped up against the house, and fuel accelerant was used when the fire was lit. Bowman was arrested and during an interview, he initially said he saw the fire but it wasn't his business, so he didn't call 911. He later told the investigators that he was upset because he asked the victims to mow his lawn the previous day and it still wasn't mowed, and then admitted to making a mistake. Bowman was charged with arson and criminal mischief, and is currently being held at the Woodbury County Jail on a $20,000 bond. 34-year-old Thessalonica Allen has been charged with murder in the fatal shooting of her husband Randy Allen. She then used an axe to partially dismember his body and tried enlisting her two teenage children to dispose of his remains. The drama unfolded on the 27th of July 2021 at an apartment located in the 1400 block of West 18th Street in La Porte, Indiana. Randy was helping the kids with her homework on the computer and came across a website their mother had visited. When Thessalonica arrived home, Randy confronted her about the website and the pair went into the bedroom and argued for a while until the children heard a loud bang. The kids then entered the room and saw Randy on the ground asking for help and to call 911. Thessalonica then told them not to call and sent them to their room. She then dragged Randy's body and put him in her daughter's closet. Thessalonica woke her kids up in the middle of the night and asked them to carry his body out of the closet and put it into the car. They tried a few times, but he was too heavy. The following day, Thessalonica went out and purchased an axe and cleaning supplies and returned to cut off Randy's legs and had her teenage children help put him into a bag and clean up the crime scene. She then attempted to involve the kids in driving the body to South Bend to be burned, but failed. On the 29th of July, the police received a tip from a man who'd once been in a relationship with Thessalonica and has a child in common with her. He explained that Thessalonica had contacted him, claiming that Randy Allen was beating the child. He told them that he arrived at her apartment and she showed him Randy's body in the closet. She asked him for help by dragging the body to her vehicle, but he declined saying he wanted to go back home. As she drove him back home, she told him that she had to shoot Randy because he was beating on her and the kids. When she dropped him off at his Michigan house, Thessalonica threw the gun out of the car. On the 1st of August, the authorities located and arrested Thessalonica in the parking lot of a Laporte Ace hardware store, where she began to sob and said, You guys don't understand he beats me. And she added that she shot her husband following a physical altercation. When investigators questioned the children, they told police that they didn't see any physical altercation and said Randy had mentioned he planned to leave. Police later recovered the partially dismembered body inside a tape from the apartment. Thessalonica said she had to cut Randy's legs off with an axe because she wasn't able to fit him inside the tote. She said she panicked and did not know what to do after she had shot him. Police recovered an axe and a bloodstained knife. They also found handwritten notes that appeared to be related to obtaining drugs violence against someone, and the disposal of a body. An autopsy revealed that Randy sustained a gunshot wound to the right arm that entered his chest and abdomen. The shot entered the spinal cord area, which doctors said most likely left Randy unable to move as he bled to death. 
Thessalonica is held in custody at the Laporte County Jail and is charged with murder, along with a string of other indictable offences, as the investigation into the matter continues. A woman has been arrested just after a shooting outside a hotel in Little Rock, Arkansas. The incident occurred at around 4pm on the 3rd of August, when deputies responded to the Little Rock Inn and Suites, located at 7501 Interstate 30, after receiving a call regarding a disturbance with a weapon. When officers arrived, they spoke to 30-year-old Ayesha Mack of North Little Rock. She explained that she was picking up some of her children at the hotel, when a 21-year-old man that she knew pulled out a gun and shot at her. Police were able to obtain surveillance footage that showed the man taking out a gun from his car, but not firing it. The video then showed Aisha getting out of her vehicle and firing several shots at the man, his girlfriend, and a four-year-old boy. Police say Aisha had a nine-year-old boy and 11-year-old girl in her vehicle. The girl could be seen on video running from the vehicle and into the hotel during the shooting. Aisha was arrested and a gun was found in her bra. She's been charged with three counts of aggravated assault, two counts of terrorist act, two counts of endangering the welfare of a minor, and criminal mischief. She's been held at the Pulaski County Jail with no bond. A young woman was arrested after allegedly killing a grandmother and her grandmother's boyfriend at their home. The incident occurred around 6.37pm on the 8th of August when deputies responded to a welfare check after a neighbour called in to report a disturbance located at 17B Eldon Avenue in Enfield, Connecticut. Several officers arrived at the property and walked to the rear of the building. There was a large piece of broken glass and a metal item at the bottom of the stairs. As one of the officers walked up to the stairs to the second floor apartment and noticed the first window to the top porch was smashed open and there was glass all over the porch and stairs. The officer continued walking and saw 72-year-old Mary Rose react in distress through the window, lying face down in a pool of blood. He could see her chest rising and falling. The officer kicked at the door to the apartment a few times in an attempt to open it and he heard a shower running from the bathroom. A young woman came out of it and into the kitchen fully clothed, but soaking wet with water and blood. The officer held the woman at gunpoint through the window and was ordered to get on her knees with her hands behind her head and not to move until the other officers arrived. After entry was made, the suspect identified as 22-year-old Harley Swalls was placed into handcuffs. The officers then searched the residence and found 63-year-old James Bell, who was Mary Rose's boyfriend. He was face down on his knees in the bedroom with a large laceration to his neck and stab wounds on his arms and back. An officer flipped the man over to perform CPR on him, but noticed he had a deep laceration from one side of his neck to the other and across an area of the artery and determined that he was unable to help him. He then went to assist Mary Rose, who was found to have a large laceration on her collarbone and neck area. She had a faint pulse and CPR was attempted on her. Paramedics arrived and she was transported to the Bay State Hospital but died shortly thereafter. Harley had wounds to her hands, which were covered in blood, and she showed no emotion when she was speaking with the officer. She was not questioned at the time, and received medical attention for her hands. Harley had a protective order issued against her by the victims due to an incident on the 7th of July 2021 on misdemeanor charges of assaulting elderly and a breach of peace. She attended court on the 9th of August, and she's required to undertake a mental health evaluation. She's held in custody on a $1 million bond as the investigation into the matter continues. A man has been arrested and charged with lewdly assaulting an eight-year-old girl after breaking into a San Jose home last week. The police were alerted to the incident at around 7.35 a.m. on the 6th of August, located at a home along the 100 block of Damson Drive in San Jose, California, just off North Jackson Avenue, near the regional medical center. The young girl was playing in her home when she was snatched by a man who entered the residence, then took her into her room, where he locked the door and violated her. After the man released the girl, she ran to her grandfather, 
He chased him out of the home and called 911. At around 9.10am, the authorities spotted a man behind the hospital, about a mile from the home. He matched the description given by the girl and arrested him. The offending suspect has been identified as 24-year-old Dupree Hornsby from Stockton. He has since been charged with eight felony counts in connection with the lewd assault of the child. The authorities stated there's no known connection between the girl and Hornsby. He was arraigned at the San Jose court on the 10th of August and is held in custody without bail at the Elmwood Men's Jail in Milpitas. His next court appearance is due on the 12th of October. If he's found guilty, he faces the prospect of life in prison. The body of missing mother, 19-year-old Anna Blanco, who disappeared five months ago in Venezuela, has been found inside her own freezer. The authorities are looking for a boyfriend who they believe is responsible for her death. Anna's disappearance did not initially raise any concerns because she would often travel from her home state of Aragua to Caracas for long periods of time without keeping in touch with her relatives. On the 29th of July, when her ex-partner and father to a four-year-old son hadn't heard from her for some time, he decided to take matters into his own hands and entered her home to see if he could find any clues to her whereabouts. When he entered the property, he was met with an overwhelming stench of death from the kitchen. He first looked inside the fridge and then the freezer when he was met with a grisly scene. She was found to have been stabbed up to 50 times with a screwdriver and left inside her own freezer in the fetal position with her hands tied and her head between her legs. He then reported the matter to the police. The authorities are trying to track down Anna's boyfriend as they believe he's responsible for her death but his whereabouts is unknown. Neighbours describe the suspect identified him only as her sway, as very jealous and abusive. A Las Vegas landlord is accused of murdering two tenants and injuring another over unpaid rent. The incident occurred on the 10th of August when 78-year-old Arnaldo Lazana Sanchez was fed up that his tenants had not paid their rent. He entered the small home where the tenants lived and opened fire with a gun. He killed two women and shot a man nine times. The authorities arrived at the crime scene to find one woman dead outside, a wounded man stumbling out the front door and another woman dead in a bedroom. The wounded man was hospitalized in a critical condition but is expected to survive. Arnaldo was arrested but refused to speak with police. Several days before the incident, he told witness Adriel Ortego that he was angry about tenants not paying rent. Ortigo suggested he go through the courts. Arnaldo said he didn't want to go through the eviction process and said he would handle it his way. Another tenant, Carlos Lopez, was in the house at the time of the shooting but was not shot. He told the authorities that he saw Arnaldo go into the bedrooms where the women pleaded for their lives. Then he heard multiple gunshots being fired and the wounded man ran out. He then left the room smiling. After the shooting, Arnoldo asked a neighbour to help him dispose of the gun, but the deputies found it in a nearby bush. All the victims were in their 50s, but their names have not been immediately released. Arnoldo remains in custody at the Clark County Detention Centre, where he faces murder and attempted murder charges as the investigation into the matter continues. A British man shot five people dead, including a three-year-old girl that the authorities believe started with a domestic dispute with his mother before turning the gun on himself. The mass shooting took place in the English city of Plymouth at around 6pm. 22-year-old crane operator Jake Davison took a pump-action shotgun and fatally shot his 51-year-old mother Maxine Davison. He then ran outside in the street and immediately shot a 3-year-old girl named Sophie Martin and a 43-year-old father Lee Martin Jake then shot at two other passerbys who were badly injured. Then he entered a park and fatally shot another man, 59-year-old Stephen Washington. He also shot a 66-year-old woman named Kate Shepard, who later died in hospital. Jake then turned the gun on himself before the authorities could tackle him. The deadly shooting spree lasted for about six minutes. Jake posted videos on YouTube under the name of Professor Waffle that have since been taken down. In his final video, he said how he was beaten down and defeated by life. He spoke about having a non-existent love life 
being depressed, and struggling to stay motivated at working out and losing weight. The authorities took the shotgun away from Jake in December of 2020, due to an assault allegation that occurred in September of 2020. They returned it back to him last month, along with the license for it, after completing an anger management course. Investigators are looking into why the gun was handed back to someone with mental issues. A man has been arrested and is facing kidnapping charges, while the authorities are investigating two murder cases at the scene. The events unfolded at 10.25pm on the 30th of June last month, when the police were called to a duplex in the 12,100 block of Schaefer Highway, Detroit, Michigan. A neighbour from across the road heard five-year-old Maggie Millsap banging on a window and yelling out for help from upstairs. As a man returns, she says, the monster is back, and she closes the curtain. Maggie lived on the right side of the residence with her single dad, Colby Millsap. Her mother passed away just months after she was born prematurely with health complications. The occupant on the left is where 30-year-old D'Angelo Clemens lives. When police arrived at the scene, Clemens was arrested and accused of taking the girl from her home and fleeing with her next door, where he held her captive for days. Clemens received a $250,000 bond with GPS tether. During the investigation, the authorities found Maggie's father murdered inside her home by the front door. That same week, another man was found shot to death just outside the building. The investigators are relatively tight-lipped about the case, as they're working towards murder charges, but are still piecing together information. The motive of the crimes are unclear. The girl now has no parents, and is in foster care. While Maggie has family in Texas, the authorities said it's unclear where the girl will go permanently. Furniture shop owner Hinawi Salem is accused of assaulting women at his store on separate occasions, the latest being while out on bond. On the 20th of July, he was arrested at his shop called Salem Furniture, located at 120 Porter Street in Bridgeport, Connecticut, but has since posted a $70,000 bond. The authorities said he lured a female customer to the basement of his business, where he requested the woman to lay down and test the mattress. Salem then told the woman that the mattress was free, before he lewdly assaulted her. Salem was previously arrested on the 25th of September last year, after three female victims made similar accusations, he was released on a $60,000 bond on those charges. That case is still pending where Salem hasn't yet entered a plea. These women said they were led to the basement on the promise of either more mattresses or discounted mattresses. From there, they were led to a specific corner where Salem knew there were no cameras set up, and that's when each one of them were violated while testing the mattress. Salem told one of the victims not to worry about what happened, adding that it could be their secret and her husband didn't have to know. Police say that woman and another were shopping with their young daughters at the time, who witnessed it all. The store's website describes the business as a place where shoppers can go to get low prices and great quality, along with fast, reliable service. The website adds that we never let anyone leave our store without a smile on their face. 30-year-old Jared Stang has been arrested in connection to an alleged kidnapping attempt of an 11-year-old girl that was captured in a chilling video. The incident occurred around 7am Tuesday the 18th of May in Pensacola, Florida. Surveillance footage shows a young girl waiting at a bus stop when a man armed with a knife exited a white Dodge journey and allegedly tried to kidnap her. The man is seen charging towards the girl, sitting in the middle of a patch of grass by a backpack while she's playing with some blue slime. The girl notices the man and attempts to flee from him, but he catches her. As he struggles pulling her back toward the vehicle, they stumble to the ground. The girl seizes the opportunity to break free, grabs a backpack, and bolts from the scene. The man then gets back into his vehicle and takes off. The girl explained to her parents about what happened, and the authorities were alerted. About 50 officers banded together to find the suspect, searching surveillance footage, tracking down witnesses and going door to door of people's homes. The investigation quickly led officers to Jared's home, where they found him wearing the same clothes that matched those worn by the man in the video though its silver bumper was freshly painted black. The suspect also had blue slime all over his arms, which the girl was playing with as the attempted abduction occurred. Jared has an extensive criminal history, including a previous charge involving an offence with a minor. The information received and response from the investigators was so swift 
that Jerry tried to paint his white Dodge journey to avoid detection from the authorities. Deputies arrested Jared and have charged him with attempted abduction, aggravated assault and battery. A St. Peter's, Missouri woman is charged with murder after she confessed to killing her daughter before slitting her own throat with a knife. The incident occurred on Friday the 14th of May when 70-year-old Donna Skaduri was in her home in the 200 block of Jody Drive along with her 39-year-old daughter. Donna's husband had arrived home from work and went to the basement to work out unaware that the two were upstairs in the home. After he finished, he went to the home's top floor, and to his horror, he found his daughter in an upstairs bedroom with a plastic bag wrapped around her head, and his wife in a nearby bathroom bleeding heavily and unconscious. He immediately contacted emergency services. Paramedics arrived and declared the daughter dead at the scene, but Donna was still breathing. She was transported to a hospital for treatment, and the authorities began an investigation into the matter. The police found a bag and a black cord wrapped around the daughter's neck, and a handful of prescription pill bottles were found in the room. Her father said he never heard any sounds of a struggle, and he didn't even know the two were home until he went upstairs. When Donna awoke in hospital a couple of days later, she was asked if she knew why she was in the hospital, and she replied euthanasia, before asking how her daughter was and saying I'm sorry. When the investigators questioned Donna, she told them that her daughter had been depressed and that she wanted to die so she planned to kill themselves. She gave her daughter prescription pills before putting a bag over her head. Her daughter then fell unconscious before she used the cord to choke her to death. Donna unsuccessfully attempted to suffocate herself by putting a bag over her head, but when that failed, she went downstairs to get a couple of knives. She then went back upstairs and stood in front of the bathroom sink, slid her own throat and blacked out. Donna faces first degree murder charge, and he's been held in custody on a $200,000 cash-only bond. 28-year-old LaRonda Presley is in prison without bail after pushing a baby in a stroller into oncoming traffic during rush hour. The incident occurred at around 5pm on the 2nd of August, located at the intersection of West Colonial Drive at Avalon Road in Winter Garden, Florida. Investigators were called to the scene on multiple reports of a woman pushing a stroller into traffic. The officers spoke with five witnesses. Each of them said they saw the woman push the child towards oncoming traffic multiple times, taking her hands off the stroller as she did so. Three of the witnesses also reported seeing her laughing as she did it. Two of the witnesses said they were driving and had to hit the brakes or swerve off the road to avoid hitting the baby. One person had recorded a portion of the incident on her cell phone. Officers said the video showed Presley pushing the child into the traffic. The authorities found Presley in a nearby parking lot, near the intersection, and found the uninjured child in the stroller, along with two unopened cans of beer, a packet of cigarettes, and a plastic jar with coins in it. Presley was arrested for aggravated abuse and attempted murder of a child. She's held without bond in the Orange County Jail. A North Carolina woman has been charged with stabbing another woman at a Burlington nightclub, as well as attacking a police officer trying to help the injured lady. The incident occurred at around 2.11am on the 14th of August, when officers responded to the club member at 2371 Corporation Parkway because of large crowds at the business. While there, they saw 26-year-old Takia Harrelson fighting with 22-year-old Anaya Love, the authorities said Takia stabbed Anaya multiple times before going into the crowd. The police officer began treating Anaya's injuries when Takia attacked again, stabbing her and striking the officer in the process. The deputy was able to pull Takia away and arrest her. Anaya was taken to a local hospital where she underwent emergency surgery and was listed in a critical condition. The officer received minor injuries which did not require medical attention. Takia is held at the Alamance County Jail and has been charged with assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill inflicting serious injury and assault with a deadly weapon on a government official. She's held in custody on a $200,000 secure bond. A 51-year-old man was assaulted by a hatchet-wielding man in the ATM lobby of a New York bank over the weekend. 
The incident occurred at around 5.20pm on the 15th of August, located at the Chase Bank on Broadway, near Beaver Street, in the Lower Manhattan area. The victim was standing in front of a cash machine when the attack approached the man and hit him in the head and thigh. After the suspect is finished beating his victim, he smashes the screens of the cash dispensing machines before walking away and leaving the hatchet and his backpack behind. Paramedics took the victim to the Bellevue Hospital, where he remains in a stable condition. A witness at the scene heard screaming, and he saw the man lying on the ground with lots of blood. The victim didn't know the assailant, and the investigators believe the attack was unprovoked. The authorities arrested a 37-year-old man matching the description of the suspect on the 17th of August, and no charges were immediately laid. 32-year-old Jarek Willis faces a multitude of abuse charges after throwing his girlfriend's daughter from a balcony. The incident occurred at around 4.45pm on the 12th of September at the Boulder Pines apartment complex located near Boulder Highway and Desert Inn Road in Las Vegas, Nevada. According to the authorities, a five-year-old girl was thrown from the third floor balcony. The police located the unconscious girl lying face first in the gravel near the apartment and she was taken to the Sunrise Hospital. She suffered from multiple broken bones, a collapsed lung and lacerated liver. The investigators spoke to the girl's mother, Angela Matthews, at the apartment. She informed them that she had been dating Jarek since March of 2021, but this was the first weekend that he had been at her apartment. She explained that her boyfriend arrived the previous day, but he stayed overnight because his vehicle had broken down. She said that they both practiced African spirituality, and Jarek said that her daughter was full of bad spirits. Angela told him to stop talking about her daughter in that way, and that she had a medical condition. Jarek apologized, but later mentioned he believed the little girl was a demon. Angela later heard a commotion in the living room, followed by her son screaming. She then saw Jarek leaning over the balcony. Her son told her that he saw Jarek drag the sister by the hair and throw her off the balcony. Angela said she thought Jarek had killed her daughter and feared for her life. She retrieved a gun from her purse and confronted him. A struggle ensued and she was bitten on her back while the two fought over control of the gun. She shot Jarek in the chest and then he ran away bleeding. The authorities followed the blood trail which led them to Jarek. He was in a critical condition and suffered multiple injuries. He was arrested and transported to the University Medical Center. He faces multiple charges of abuse and attempted murder. He is held on a $150,000 bond with conditions that he does not contact the victim or go to the victim's address. Angela has not been charged with a crime. A 31-year-old man has been found guilty in the brutal murder of 20-year-old Willow Watkins. He was beaten, strangled, wrapped in garbage bags, dumped in a well and then covered in cement in Vance, Alabama. Kendall Battles was convicted of murder on the 15th of September 2021 in Tuscaloosa County, Alabama. His sentencing is set for the 17th of November. He faces anywhere between 10 years to life in prison. Three other people were reportedly involved in Willow's death. 30-year-old Devin Trent Hall pleaded guilty to murder in July and was sentenced to 30 years. Kendall's wife, Monique Battles, and another suspect, Joseph Nevels, faced trial at a later date. Willow was reported missing on the 15th of June 2019 by her grandmother. On the 29th of July 2019, her body was discovered about 30 feet down an abandoned well in Tuscaloosa County after detectives received a tip from Kendall's brother. It took investigators more than 12 hours to excavate the well and recover her body. The authorities described the recovery of Willow's body as a brutal scene, which took planning and multiple people to carry it out. Willow had been staying at a home in Tanya Drive in McKellar. Joseph told investigators that in 2019, that Willow stole his cell phone. He said it contained photos of his late grandmother, and he got upset so he hit her in the head with a shotgun. He said that all four of them beat Willow with their hands, feet, and a metal baseball bat. She was beaten so badly that all her teeth were knocked out. Joseph said that Devon then strangled her to death with a cord. Her body was wrapped in garbage bags, and driven to a well at an abandoned property 12 miles away in Willwalker Lane in Vance. They then dumped her inside it, before filling it with concrete. 
A baseball bat was reportedly found during a search at one of the suspect's homes. An autopsy revealed that Willow died of blunt force trauma and asphyxiation. Willow was a graduate of McAdory High School and was once involved in high school pageants. Her mother, Miranda Lynch, was found dead in a pool of blood on the bathroom floor of a mobile home on the 7th of August 2015. Police said that she was held against her will for days and repeatedly beaten before she died of her injuries. Authorities at the time said Lynch was killed by three female friends who held her hostage and beat her to death for her boyfriend's food stamps. Willow's father is also dead and she was particularly close to her grandmother. Her grandmother Kathy Harrison said, We miss her so much. She was so sweet and so kind and loved everybody. A UK man who bludgeoned his mother to death with a hammer and left her decomposing remains in a home for two months has been sentenced to a minimum of 21 and a half years in prison. 43-year-old Dale Morgan murdered 68-year-old Judith Reed after she found out he had been stealing from her and confronted him. In December of 2020, Dale repeatedly and brutally bashed her over the head with a hammer at least 14 times and left her body in the blood-stained bedroom of the home in Market Street, Pembroke Dock in Pembrokeshire. Dale continued to live in his mother's flat as he tried to conceal what he had done, walking a dog, lying to her concerned friends when they asked where she was. He would tell them that she's isolating at home because of COVID, was ill, or in hospital. On the 20th of February 2021, police went to her house after a concerned friend requested a welfare check on her. Dale was out that day, and an officer peered through the bedroom window and saw Judy's body. Her decomposing and partially clothed body was slumped in a kneeling position against her bed. She had a plastic bag over her head and an electric cable wrapped around her neck. There was blood on the sheets and officers found a hammer at the foot of the bed that had fatty deposits on it. Later that night, realising his time was up, Dale turned himself into the Haverford West Police Station and admitted to killing his mother. He was arrested and has been held in custody since. Following his arrest, Dale responded no comment while being interviewed and said very little to give any sort of account of what happened or why. Judy was last seen alive on the 11th of December and it's believed she was murdered before Christmas with unopened gifts still in her home. Investigators found a written note by Judy expressing concerns about her son stealing money from her and his drug addiction. Bank account records show that between the 3rd of December 2020 and the 11th of February 2021, Dale transferred £2,878 in 11 transactions from his mother's account to his own and withdrew the money in cash. An autopsy revealed that Judy died from blunt force trauma. On the 31st of August 2021, Dale pleaded guilty to murder during a court hearing. On the 4th of October 2021, Dale was sentenced to serve a minimum of 21 and a half years in jail. David Cox and Jeremy Engelman both 26 from Flint, Michigan, were arrested over the weekend for firing shots at a state police helicopter. The incident occurred at 2.30 in the morning on the 2nd of October. The authorities responded to the area around Miller and Hammerberg Roads in Flint on reports of shots fired. Troopers in the helicopter located two men on the bridge in the Happy Hollow Nature area, southeast of the location who were passing a firearm back and forth. As the helicopter patrolled above the area and monitored them, one of the men pointed the firearm along a creek, firing several shots, before handing the weapon to a second person. The second man then pointed the firearm at the helicopter and fired at least five shots at it. As it was fired upon, the helicopter's crew guided police on the ground to the men. They arrested both suspects and recovered a firearm. There were no injuries, nor was there any damage to the aircraft. The men remain held in custody at the Genesee County Jail on a $50,000 bond. They've been charged with intent to murder, terrorism, attempted malicious destruction of police property, and using a firearm during the commission of a felony. If convicted, each could face up to life in prison. A 58-year-old man has been charged with murder after allegedly beating his wife, 37-year-old Cherry Ogre, leading to her death. The drama unfolded at around 12.30pm on the 26th of July when her husband, 58-year-old Anthony Ogar, called emergency services after his wife sustained severe head injuries the night before. The authorities were alerted to her condition 
and the paramedics rushed Cherry from the Port Hughes home in South Australia's York Peninsula to the Woolaroo Hospital. Cherry was in a critical condition and suffering from severe brain injuries. She was then airlifted to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, where she later died on the 28th of July. The authorities arrived at the couple's home and collected evidence from the crime scene, including a walking stick. Anthony was arrested and originally charged with aggravated assault causing serious harm, but the charge has now been upgraded to murder. Anthony told police that his wife was drunk and fell backwards, but could not explain why his wife had a huge lump on her forehead the size of a tennis ball. Cherry's daughter, who used to live with the couple, said she had witnessed domestic violence on a number of occasions, which Anthony denied, saying his stepdaughter was just looking for someone to blame. Anthony's held in custody and has been refused bail as the investigation into the matter continues. A mother has been arrested after three children were found living in appalling conditions. The incident came to light after a neighbour in Fillmore Avenue in Palm Bay, Florida, contacted the authorities on the 24th of July to tell them that a young girl was seen by herself in their screened-in patio. Officers responded and arrived at the scene and approached the young girl. They realised that she was non-verbal and had a disability, but she was able to tell the police officers that she lived next door. When officers went to the girl's house, the mother, 43-year-old Melissa Doss, refused to open the front door for them. She instead climbed over the back fence and wandered around the home to speak to the officers. When she was questioned why the girl was next door, she explained that her daughter had severe autism and that she was asleep at the time and hadn't noticed that she had gotten out of the house. The deputies kept pressing to be let inside the home, but Melissa continued refusing to open the door for them. The officers left the area, but quickly received another call from the same neighbour. He said that the child was back at their house again. The officers returned and spoke to Melissa, but she still continued to refuse to let them check their house. She said she was at the end of her rope. She explained that if she let them in, they would contact the Florida Department of Children and Families. The officers left the property and contacted Child Protective Services. The investigators from the department arrived the following day and entered the home through the back door and were met with an overwhelming stench of feces and urine. Inside they found a large homemade cage made of wood and a metal-like chicken wire. The cage was tall, almost to the ceiling, and with enough space to accommodate a twin bed. Inside the cage there was a blanket and a pillow. Melissa told the investigators that she used the cage to lock the autistic girl up during the night to keep her inside the house. She explained that every morning the girl would scream until she was let out. Next to the cage was a bed where another child slept. The investigators described the house as uninhabitable. The roof was covered in mould and parts of the roof were collapsing. The floor was completely littered in garbage and there were bugs, spiders, flies and other insects all over the place. None of the bathrooms in the house were functional. Instead they used a bucket in the restroom and threw the waste in the backyard. The house had no access to food or water. The girl and two siblings were removed from the property. Melissa was arrested and charged with a string of offences relating to the abuse and neglect of the children. She's held at the Brevard County Jail on a $20,000 bond. Young couple 25-year-old Yasmin Perez and 24-year-old Giovanni Azuaga were shot on Saturday night on the 19th of June amid Puerto Rican Day festivities in Humboldt Park, Chicago, Illinois. At around 9.15pm after the parade had finished, the couple were driving along the 3,200 block of West Division, displaying the Puerto Rican flag from their car. They became involved in a minor accident after re-ending a parked car. Inside the vehicle were a group of six men who got out and swarmed around the couple's car. They dragged Perez out and she was shot in the neck. When her partner tried to intervene, another person shot him in the head, hip and thigh. The attackers then fled the scene as the couple lay in the street next to their car. The paramedics arrived and transported the couple to a hospital. Azagua died that night, while Perez died three days later. The couple was survived by the two young children. The youngest one is due to turn one on the 25th of June. An investigation into the matter is continuing as police search for those responsible. The authorities said that on the 21st of June, they have promising leads and have identified one of the shooters. 
As of the 22nd of June, no arrests have been made and no attackers have been named. Three people have been arrested after a Texas woman was allegedly robbed at gunpoint in a home by two teenage suspects while on a Zoom meeting with her colleagues. The incident occurred around 2.50pm on Friday the 18th of June, located on the 5,500 block of Pekin Springs Road in San Antonio. The woman was in her bedroom attending an online forum for work when 19-year-old Adrian Gillen, along with a 15-year-old girl, whose name's been suppressed due to being a minor, forced their way into her home. Adrian held a gun at the woman's head and demanded her belongings. While this was happening, the victim's co-workers witnessed the horrifying ordeal during a virtual meeting and quickly alerted a boss who contacted the authorities. The pair continued to ransack her home, taking a number of items including a safe. The duo then took off in a Honda Accord driven by a third suspect, 39-year-old Jamie Trevino. Deputies tracked the trio to another house they raided approximately 12 miles away, located in the 4,300 block of Fortuna Street, where Adrian and Jamie broke into a safe. They all began emptying the contents of the safe into a car and fled the scene. The police were onto them, and a helicopter monitored their movements to a hotel. The suspects got out of the vehicle and began unloading the stolen property, but the authorities arrived on scene and arrested them, recovering the stolen items in the process. Adrian had an outstanding warrant for his arrest in a separate incident for capital murder. He was charged with aggravated robbery and theft and is held at the Bear County Jail on a $1 million bond relating to murder charges. Jamie was charged with aggravated robbery and theft and is held on a $175,000 bond. Charges and bond details for the 15-year-old are unavailable due to her age. A Florida woman has been charged with manslaughter after killing a teenage daughter during a hospital visit last month. 14-year-old Jasmine Singletary, who has special needs, was admitted to the Ascension Sacred Heart Hospital on the 8th of July after developing an infection. She would routinely receive treatment at the Pensacola Hospital for a neuromuscular disorder. On the 13th of July, while her 34-year-old mother Jessica Bortle and her grandmother were visiting her in the ward, she suddenly lost consciousness and stopped breathing. Hospital staff tried applying life-saving measures, but were unsuccessful, and Jasmine was pronounced dead a short time later. On the 21st of July, an autopsy revealed that Jasmine had injuries that were not present when she was admitted to hospital. She had catastrophic damage to her ribs and liver, which was ripped open. The internal wounds were caused by blunt force trauma, which were similar to those found in traffic crash victims. The medical examiner said the injuries were so severe, she would have died within minutes of them being inflicted, meaning she would have sustained them while being confined to her hospital bed. The investigators questioned Jessica, and she initially lied by saying nothing happened in the hospital room, before finally confessing to causing her injuries. It's reported that Jessica became angry after Jasmine swore at her about the colour of the crayons, and broke a few of them before tossing them across the room. Upset, Jessica grabbed a hospital table and slammed it into Jasmine's abdomen and started leaning on it with all of her weight, crushing her liver in the process. Jasmine's grandmother told the investigators that she witnessed the ordeal and asked Jessica to calm down and said that's just how Jasmine is. A few minutes later she heard Jasmine say grandma and then saw her eyes roll back in her head. Jessica was seen on camera outside Jasmine's room, shaking and flexing her hand, as if in pain. After an exhaustive investigation, Jessica was arrested on the 14th of August. She's been charged with aggravated manslaughter. A few days later, she attended the Escambia County Court by video, where a bomb was set at $500,000. She's held at the Escambia County Jail, and if convicted, she faces the possibility of up to 30 years in prison. A man and a woman in Massachusetts have been arrested for kidnapping a four-day-old baby girl over the weekend. The mother met the woman, identified as 19-year-old Cassidy Lozier Quavis, on Facebook and had frequently contacted her but never met in person. The woman arranged to pick her and the baby up just before 9.15am on the morning of the 21st of August to go out and grab a coffee. They stopped at a golf gas station located at 590 Southbridge Street in Worcester, Massachusetts. 
As she briefly entered the store, Cassidy took the baby and drove away with her. The mother exited the store and immediately contacted the police. The authorities found Cassidy's car at around 10.10am 10, 10 in nearby Shrewsbury, but there were no signs of her or the baby. The police received information that Cassidy might be with a male, identified as 23-year-old Daquan Jefferson, and the baby in the Lincoln Street area. At around 12.05pm, officers received a call that a male had left the baby with an uninvolved citizen at Subway at 490 Lincoln Street. The citizen at Subway called, and the officers responded, and the mother was reunited with the child, who appeared to be safe and unharmed. Deputies were able to locate Daquan and Cassidy at a Wendy's store down the road. They were both arrested and each of them were charged with kidnapping and reckless endangerment of a child as the investigation into the matter continues. A Louisville, Kentucky man has been arrested and charged with offences relating to choking, beating and imprisoning his ex-girlfriend without food or water. 37-year-old Timothy Guest of 2700 block of Delore Avenue and the victim used to live together. The victim was with a friend the day she was kidnapped. Tim showed up and forced the victim to come home with him and she agreed. When they arrived at his home, the victim said Tim would not let her leave and threatened to kill her by shooting her if she tried. He punched her several times, struck her with a metal wire and a tiki torch and then proceeded to strangle her. At one point she managed to break free and make it outside. She made it to the middle of the street, but Tim caught up with her and grabbed her by the neck and dragged her back inside the home. Neighbours saw what was happening outside and called the police. By the time the police arrived at the home, Tim was gone. Officers say they heard the woman screaming and found her locked in the basement without food or water and she was barricaded with a marble block. The officers managed to free her and when they did they noticed bruising to her face and body and she had trouble breathing from the strangulation. She was then taken to hospital for treatment. The authorities arrested him on Thursday the 13th of May and is currently being held at the Louisville Metro Correction Centre. He appeared in the Jefferson District Court that same morning and has pleaded not guilty to charges which include kidnapping and strangulation as the trial continues. A Washington man walking his dog nearby a lake was shot dead by a bystander after acting aggressively towards other people on the sidewalk. The incident occurred around 3.30pm on Tuesday the 11th of May, along a path around Silver Lake in Everett. Unprovoked, he started yelling and becoming aggressive towards the pedestrians, including a grandmother and a young granddaughter. Several men tried to intervene, but the dog walker responded by pepper spraying and striking them with the metal baton. Then one of the men who tried stopping the attacker pulled out a pistol and shot him twice. The injured man was taken to a local hospital, but he later succumbed to his injuries. Witnesses of the shooting say that the man who was shot had been chasing families with weapons and striking others before a bystander pulled a gun and shot him. Animal control have assumed custody of the dog. The shooter and other witnesses were interviewed by detectives and to date no arrests have been made as the investigation into the matter continues. A legal guardian of a nine-year-old girl has been charged for repeatedly beating and starving her. 56-year-old Stephanie Gregory of Galloway, New Jersey, was charged on Wednesday the 12th of May with not feeding the girl properly and using a metal spatula to beat her with, leading to open wounds and welts on her body. The girl was found in an extremely emaciated state and could hardly walk when the child protection officials removed her from Stephanie's custody. She was then taken to a hospital for one week to recuperate. Stephanie was arrested with the help of the SWAT team and is held in custody at the Atlantic County Jail pending a detention hearing. She's now facing a slew of charges, including aggravated assault, endangering the welfare of a child, as well as possession of a controlled dangerous substance for keeping heroin. 26-year-old Jake Guidry has been arrested and charged with murder of his 11-month-old daughter, Zebra Guidry. At just after 12.15am on the 28th of September, Deputies responded to a residence in the 600 block of Brugillo Road in Thibodeau, Louisiana. Authorities said they were called to the scene to check on the baby on behalf of her mother. When deputies arrived, they made contact with Jake, who allegedly said he struck the child too hard and the child had died. Deputies located the toddler's lifeless body in the rear cargo area of his SUV. 
Jake was arrested and charged with murder. He's held at the Lafouche Parish Correctional Center and his bail is set at $1 million. If convicted, he faces life in prison without parole. 44-year-old Natalie Brothwell was arrested this week and has been charged with murdering her two children in their California home last year. At around 7.50am on the 4th of December in 2020, the decapitated bodies of the 13-year-old daughter, Malaka Taya, and 12-year-old son, Maurice Taylor Jr., were discovered at their home, located in the 45,000 block of Century Circle, Lancaster, California. The fire department received a call at the location regarding a possible gas leak. The fire personnel arrived and made entry into the location, at which time they saw the two headless bodies. They then contacted the sheriff's office, who responded to the scene and quickly secured the area. Natalie, who's been living in Arizona since, was arrested in the Tuscan home on the 28th of September. She'll be extradited to California. Her alleged role in the murders wasn't made immediately clear by the authorities. The children's father, 35-year-old Maurice Taylor Sr., was earlier charged in their deaths and remains in custody and faces the prospect of life in prison. Maurice Sr., who's a personal trainer, allegedly murdered the children on the 29th of November. It's reported that he forced his two surviving sons, who were eight and nine years old at the time, to stay in their rooms without food for several days, and were made to live alongside their older siblings' bodies for five days. A man stabbed three of his neighbours, one fatally, before taking his own life. The incident occurred at around 11pm on the 29th of September at a home located at 174 Walnut Drive, near Hickory Lane in the town of Beekman, New York. The authorities say they responded to a report of an active disturbance in which a male was stabbing other people. The investigators say that 32-year-old Willem Celsius started an altercation with his neighbours, during which time he stabbed three of them multiple times before slitting his own throat and dying at the scene. 35-year-old William McGorty was pronounced dead on the spot. The other two victims, 30-year-old Robert McGorty and 58-year-old Edward McGorty, were rushed to Mid-Hudson Regional Hospital with life-threatening injuries. The investigators say the victims and the suspect were known to each other, but the nature of the dispute was unknown. The motive remains under investigation. An Alabama woman who was wanted for a knife and machete attack on a man who owed her money has turned herself in while her son still remains at large. The incident occurred at 9pm on Saturday night on the 8th of May, located at Jones Street in Daphne, when a male victim was assaulted by 36-year-old Tamikiel Williams and a 22-year-old son Jalen Williams. The victim was held against his will at knife point for several hours at the Williams' home. The victim had been at the property doing some yard work, working off a debt he incurred when Tamikia bonded him out of jail a few months earlier on drug offences. When he finished the work, they told him to come inside. For the next few hours, they held him at knife point. He tried to escape and when he got to the door, they began stabbing him. Jalen stabbed the victim several times with the butcher's knife and Tamikia slashed him across the arm with a machete. He managed to escape from the home and ran for his life screaming without shoes on to a nearby restaurant. His shirt was bloody and torn, he had shorts on and he was covered in blood from top to toe. He explained to the restaurant owner that he just escaped from a home and he was being held captive and the authorities were contacted. He was in a bad state and he was transported to the university hospital where he was treated for his injuries. After examining the injuries and recovering blood and physical evidence at the Joneses Street home, police said they had no reason to doubt their victim's story. Investigators said that all parties have prior arrest history in Daphne, and the dead ode was related to that history. Police say that Tamika recently turned herself in, but refuses to say anything regarding the whereabouts of her son. The victim has since been released from hospital, and is lucky to be alive. Tamika and Jalen both face charges of second-degree assault and unlawful imprisonment. However, Jalen still remains at large. On the 14th of May, Valley, Alabama resident Hubert Timothy Sprayberry was found guilty of murdering 72-year-old James Edmund Clark. On the 19th of December 2019, 
James was reported missing after not being seen for about three weeks. After investigators obtained search warrants for James, they arrived at Hubert's property on Sunday night, on the 29th of December. The investigators found a concrete well, which was covered by a concrete lid. When the lid was removed, there was an overwhelming stench. As they covered their noses to look inside the well, a pair of shoes were seen floating on top of the water. A hook was lowered into the well, which first hooked onto two cinder blocks linked by a rope. The second time the hook was lowered, it hooked onto James's decomposed body. The body had 22 stab wounds, as well as three gunshot wounds to the head. After Hubert killed him, he stripped him bare of all of his clothes, tied a plastic bag around his head to make sure he was dead, before tying one cinder block around his neck and another around his feet and throwing him headfirst into the well. It took several agencies over two and a half hours to retrieve all of the remains. DNA evidence positively identified the body as James. Detectives were also able to match the rope and duct tape found in Hubert's van, which matched those to bind James's body. Further evidence shows that Hubert was packing up his belongings and getting ready to leave town before the cops could find out what he was hiding. His belongings were packed into boxes and bags, and a mattress in his room was gone. Investigators discovered the charred remains of a mattress in a fire pit outside. Hubert, who was 58 at the time of the offence, was arrested and charged with murder just after midnight that same night. After the jury found Hubert guilty, he now awaits sentencing and will most likely spend the rest of his days behind bars. Hubert and James were acquaintances and neighbours, and to this day, the motive of the attack still remains unknown. A man has been arrested and charged with murder after being accused of strangling and setting his wife on fire. The incident occurred just before 1.30pm on the 30th of September when firefighters responded to a report of a house fire located at 3532 No Bixby Road in Columbus, Ohio. After extinguishing the fire, first responders discovered a deceased woman in the basement of the house who was later identified as Fatimata Diallo and it was determined that she had been strangled and then set ablaze. Video surveillance captured her husband, 41-year-old Mamadou Diallo, coming and going to the home at the time of the fire. His two children, aged two and three, were at home at the time, but they were able to make it out alive. Authorities say that Mamadou was the one who called 911 to report the fire. He never mentioned to the dispatcher that Fatimata was inside the home, but said that the kids were out. Investigators say he refused to talk, other than to say that he had recently returned from Ghana. Mamadou was arrested and charged with aggravated arson, murder, and tampering with evidence. On the 30th of September 2021, 44-year-old student Weldon of Springfield, Massachusetts, was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison after pleading guilty to a slew of indictable offences, which include kidnapping, lewd assault, and the murder of three women in 2018. Stewart's trial was originally scheduled for April of 2020, but was postponed due to the pandemic. Stewart was arrested in May of 2018, after deputies went to pull him over for a broken tail light, but quickly escalated into a car chase. Officers managed to use force to stop his vehicle. Inside the car they spotted a woman with visible injuries, and Stewart was taken into custody. The woman said that Stewart held a captive for over a month at his home, located at 1,333 Page Boulevard, adding that he violated her and beat her with a hammer and other objects. The woman was transported to hospital with what deputies describe as grotesque and violent injuries. She suffered abdominal trauma from being stabbed, signs of being hit with a blunt object, and a leg infection. The woman thanked an officer for saving her life, saying she thought she would never get away. On the 30th of May 2018, officers searched Stewart's residence where they were met with a pungent stench. Upon investigation, the decomposing remains of three women were found in and around the property. They were discovered in the basement bathroom, buried under their garage, and stashed in the shed on the property. The medical examiner identified the victims as 47-year-old Ernestine Rines, 34-year-old America Lydon, and 27-year-old Kayla Escalante. He plied his victims with drugs, held them captive, and lewdly assaulted them before strangling them to death. On the 16th of August 2018, Stuart was initially indicted for 52 charges against him, involving not just the three dead women, but a total of 11 victims. 
The total number of charges were eventually brought down to 39 after a plea deal was reached and he eventually pleaded guilty on the 28th of September 2021 after saying he just wants to close the case. Stewart had been diagnosed with bipolar, dyslexia, ADHD and had a first grade education. 61 year old Florida man Nelson Rivera has been charged with murdering his 62 year old girlfriend Elizabeth Crisanti. On the 22nd of September, after Elizabeth failed to collect a 5 year old and 11 year old granddaughters from school, her sister requested a welfare check on her. At around 3.20 pm, officers went to Elizabeth's home, which was the second unit along 240 Orange Grove Drive in Ormond Beach, Florida. Initially, when deputies arrived, no one answered the door. Elizabeth's sister arrived with the key, which allowed the officers to gain entry into the home. At the entrance to the bedroom, they found blood and what appeared to be a shaving razor on the floor. Inside, they found Elizabeth's lifeless body lying on the ground, with a knife sticking out of her chest. Blood was all around her, on the floor, and on a nearby hamper. The autopsy showed that she sustained stab wounds on her body, as well as cuts to her face, and cuts and bruising to her hands. She had also been strangled. Nelson was found face up on the bed in the same room, alive but unconscious. He had scratches under his right eye, consistent with an injury from a fingernail. He also had blood on his feet and hands, but he had no injuries on him which would cause him to have all that blood on him, the authorities said. While investigating Elizabeth's murder, the deputies said they found evidence through relatives and friends that she was fearful of Nelson and described their relationship as toxic. Nelson was described as extremely controlling and would check all her phone messages and would not allow her to go anywhere without him. Around the time of her murder, she was planning an exit strategy from the relationship. She even told a friend from Connecticut that if anything were to happen to her, that he killed her. At the crime scene, there were no signs of forced entry into the premises. However, detectives found signs of a struggle within the residence. There was a broken rosary found next to Elizabeth's right foot and beads were scattered throughout the bedroom. On the 26th of September, a warrant for Nelson's arrest was issued and he was transported from hospital to the Volusia County Jail where he is held without bond. A 57-year-old Billy Idaho woman has been arrested after she allegedly tried killing a partially paralyzed husband by putting a trash bag over his head while he was sleeping. Eight years prior, he suffered a stroke and lost 80% of the function on his right side. He met Mildred Hope in September of 2019, and they married five months later. At around 6pm on the 19th of September 2021, her husband slept on a recliner with a small blanket over him. It was reported that Mildred grabbed a much larger blanket from the home office, and wrapped it around him, and tucked it very tightly into the sides of the chair to restrain him. She then placed a white plastic garbage bag over his head. Startled, he awoke and started fighting for his life. Struggling to breathe, he managed to tear a hole in the bag. Mildred continued to fight him and tried holding him down and repositioned the bag and tightened it around his neck. He managed to dig his feet into the footrest of the recliner and push himself back in an attempt to free himself from his wife and the bag. The chair broke and he rolled out of it and onto the floor. Mildred was standing on his left side. She grabbed the bag and two tie-down straps that were next to the chair and left the room. He called his sister and told her what happened. He then contacted the police. When the authorities arrived, Mildred was sitting on the couch in the living room and they separated the couple while questioning them. The chair her husband was on was fully reclined, broken and tipped to one side. They asked Mildred where the garbage bag was and she told them to check the trash cans. They found the bag stuffed halfway down the garbage can covered with waste paper and food. The bag had nothing in it, but there were two stretch marks on it the size of hands and fingers, along with two small holes. They also recovered two black straps from the home office, and two blankets that were near the chair. Mildred was arrested and booked into the Cashew County Jail that night. She has been charged with attempted murder, attempted strangulation, and alteration or concealment of evidence. Her bomb was set at $1 million. An Indiana man has been charged with murder in the beating of his girlfriend's 17-month-old toddler whose heart was ripped in half. It all began at 10.45am on Monday the 17th of May 
at 2746 Millbrook Drive in Fort Wayne. Josephine and Clark left her baby twins alone with a 27-year-old boyfriend, Shaquille Rowe, while she went out with her cousin. At 12.30pm, Shaquille contacted the authorities when he found that 17-month-old Aiden Clark wasn't breathing, and he tried giving the child CPR. While on the phone, the dispatcher heard him saying, why did she leave me in the house like this? When first responders arrived, after going inside, they found Aiden on the floor of the apartment. Paramedics took over to try and apply life-saving measures and transported Aiden to the Lutheran Hospital for emergency care, but he was pronounced dead. The medical staff noticed bruising around his neck and chest and believed the child was abused, so they contacted the detective bureau to investigate the matter. Shaquille was interviewed at the home and later at the police station. He told the officers that his girlfriend and the children's mother Jasmine Clark had left with the cousin and said goodbye to him. He said he got out of the shower to check on the kids and found Aiden lying on the ground next to an air mattress while his twin sister Aubrey was standing there crying. Shaquille said Aiden was wheezing so he ran to the neighbour to get a phone to call 911 and attempt CPR. Jasmine arrived a little later and was very emotional, asking what was going on. She explained to the officer that she left the premises around 10.45am and left Shaquille with the kids, but refused to speak any more about the matter or sign any forms. She said she just wanted to go to the hospital to see Aiden, so she left. A male witness arrived on scene well after the incident and told the detective that he knew Jasmine really well. He said that Jasmine was at his house when they got the phone call from Shaquille when they learned that something was wrong with Aiden. He said that he lives about 15 minutes away. At 9am the following day, an autopsy was completed on Aiden. The medical examiner confirmed that Aiden had died of blunt force trauma to his chest and his death was ruled a homicide. It was further advised that the baby suffered a fractured sternum and his heart was ripped in half, causing massive internal bleeding. It was also stated that the child suffered from blunt force trauma to his left midsection, causing a lacerated spleen and hemorrhaging around his kidney and pancreas. It was estimated the boy died within two to five minutes of sustaining his injuries. Not long after Shaquille was let out on bond on lesser charges of abuse, he's been rearrested and is back in custody. He's now facing a murder charge, along with a string of other indictable offences relating to the beating death of Aiden. He's held in the Allen County Jail as he awaits trial. 88-year-old Missouri man, Larry Shaw has been charged with the murder of 52-year-old Kenneth Barnes. The pair had lived together for about seven years in a home owned by Barnes, located along the 2700 block of North 31st Street in Ozark, just east of Fremont Road. Shaw tired of his younger roommate bossing him around, telling him to do chores, calling him names while using vulgar language. He felt belittled by him and badly mistreated. Shaw's routine started as normal on Wednesday morning on the 19th of May. He had breakfast and had his prescription pills. He then went upstairs and grabbed a handgun, stored it in between the cushions of the couch, and waited patiently in a recliner before Barnes went upstairs. Three hours later at 11.30am, Barnes approached him and ordered him to do some chores. At that moment, he grabbed the gun and shot him once in the chest. Barnes's daughter also went up to Shaw and asked what happened. He told her her dad was hurt and needed help. Barnes ran for help, while Shaw continued sitting in his recliner, until Barnes's daughter ran outside hysterical. As his daughter performed CPR on Barnes, the authorities were contacted, and when they arrived at the property, they found Barnes lying dead outside. Shaw told the investigators they'd consider going outside to shoot him in the head to make sure he was dead. A paramedic at the scene told police that Shaw was still holding a gun when they arrived, and made spontaneous utterances while on scene about shooting and killing Barnes. Shaw was immediately taken into custody. When the detective asked Shaw if he was in fear when he shot Barnes, he said he wasn't scared and he was kind of tickled when he shot him, and he made it very clear that he was glad he was dead and had absolutely no remorse for his actions. The detective asked Shaw what he believed should happen to him after what he did to Barnes. He said, well, I hope I get the chance to piss on his grave. Shaw has been held in the Christian County Jail in Ozark with no bond, while the police are still investigating the circumstances of the death. Police have just released a video of a gunman wanted in the fatal shooting at a New York nightclub on the 9th of May. The incident occurred around 3.48am inside the bar located at 4555 3rd Avenue Sunset Park in Brooklyn. 
The victim got into an argument with an unidentified male over whose turn it was to use the bathroom. The dispute escalated shortly thereafter when the unidentified male produced a handgun and shot the victim once in the head before fleeing the crowded room. Emergency services were contacted and when first responders arrived, they found an unconscious and unresponsive man laying on the ground with a gunshot wound to the head. The authorities identified the victim as 30-year-old Shamar Watt. Watt was rushed to the St. Barnabas Hospital, but he succumbed to his injuries two days later. Police are still looking for the gunman as he remains at large. A man attacks a woman with a knife along a New York substation platform, but she's saved by another commuter as he's wrestled away from her. The incident occurred along the Union Square subway station. A man was walking along a platform just after 10pm, Wednesday the 19th of May, when without warning, he lunges at a 54-year-old woman with blonde hair and a black dress, stabbing her in the collarbone and the back of her shoulder multiple times. A man named Sean Connorboy had the man in his sights as he was acting suspiciously leading up to the assault. Then as the man attacks the woman, Sean immediately springs into action to save her. He said that the victim was pulled backward by the attacker and she screamed, and then an arm and a hand came out with a fairly long blade, five inch dagger maybe, and made an arching sweeping motion. Sean said that his natural instincts kicked in that led him to rescue the woman by wrestling the attacker to the ground. Other commuters stepped in to help, pinning the suspect's ankles and feet down until the police arrived. At the time he felt vulnerable and said, I was able to work my forearm under his throat and I pulled his hair back to prevent him from biting me because he was attempting to bite my arm. As the attacker was held down, the authorities arrived and arrested the suspect. The suspect has since been identified as 22-year-old Joshua Nazario. Nazario reportedly suffers from schizophrenia and it was said that his medication ran out. He was held in custody as the authorities investigate the matter. Meanwhile, the victim is at home recovering and Sean is happy he made it out alive. Two arrests have been made in Texas after a man was beaten to death and dragged behind a pickup truck before setting it on fire. The incident occurred on Saturday the 12th of June when 37-year-old Robert Hoffpower severely beat his mother's ex-boyfriend, 60-year-old Roman Rodriguez, into submission after an altercation erupted between both men. Robert then grabbed a rope and tied a toe strap around Roman's waist, then tied the other end to Roman's own pickup truck and dragged him for about a mile from the home. The truck was then set ablaze before abandoning it on the road. Officers were called to the scene at 10pm that night on reports of a burning truck along an isolated road. As they approached the scene, a trail of blood could be seen for several hundred yards until they found the lifeless body of Roman behind a burnout truck just north of Rye, Texas. Evidence discovered at the site led the authorities to the home of Robert and his 56-year-old mother, Tommy Ann Cole. The investigators said the night Roman was killed, he'd gone inside the home of his ex-girlfriend when a domestic disturbance broke out. A physical altercation ensued which spilled outdoors and got totally out of control. Robert was arrested the following evening and has been charged with murder and abuse of a corpse and he's been held at the Liberty County Jail on a $1 million bond. Time he was later arrested on the afternoon on the 16th of June and has been charged with tampering with physical evidence and abuse of a corpse. No details have been provided at this stage around jail or bond for her. Investigators are waiting for an autopsy to determine whether Roman was alive at the time he was dragged. A Cordova, South Carolina man was murdered earlier this month after meeting with a seller through Facebook when he went to buy an all-terrain vehicle from him. The incident occurred around 12.30pm on the 9th of June at Saddle Ridge Road in Branchville. 34-year-old Alexander Presley travelled around 18 miles with his pregnant wife and two children to buy an ATV from a 17-year-old boy named Edward Stokes. Alexander gave $4,600 to Edward, who had brought a 13-year-old boy with him. Alexander then loaded the ATV onto a trailer attached to his SUV. Alexander's wife, Kayla Cox, then noticed the seller started acting strange, and she got a feeling that something bad was about to happen. That was when Edward attacked Alexander. He offered Edward whatever he wanted. Edward then grabbed Alexander by the back of his neck and shot him. Edward then pointed the gun at Kayla, forcing her and her children to get out of the vehicle. Edward and the 13-year-old then got in and drove off, before Alexander died at the scene. Deputies found the SUV abandoned about 7 miles away. Then at around 3.30pm, 
they spotted Edward walking along a road between the crime scene and where the SUV was dumped. Edward was arrested and is held in custody without bond. He's been charged with murder and two counts of armed robbery and he's been tried as an adult. The 13-year-old boy who was with Edward was also arrested and charged with armed robbery and with an accessory before and after the fact of murder. A mentally ill Minnesota man has been arrested after admitting to fatally shooting a professor after crashing a stolen car in his front yard. The events unfolded early Sunday morning on the 20th of June when 45-year-old Jason Robert Beckman drove to St. Cloud in a borrowed pickup truck to visit his family in the area. Along the way at around 5am, the truck broke down on the 400 block of Park Meadows Drive in Wake Park, so he went looking for another vehicle. During this time, he saw a man in a grocery store parking lot pointing a tan rifle at him. But Jason wasn't sure if it was real or a delusion, as he suffers from a multitude of mental illnesses, including PTSD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and manic depressive disorder, and had been using substances in the prior days. He then looked around a Wake Park car dealership for any unlocked cars to steal. At around 5.30am, he found an Audi outside a business that was left running in the parking lot. He stole the car and took off in it, but got lost in the St. Cloud neighbourhood. At just after 6am, he encountered a branch in the middle of the road, so he swerved to miss it. Instead, he crashed the vehicle into the front yard of a residence on the 2600 block of Island View Drive in St. Cloud. He then knocked on the resident's front door to ask for help. When 68-year-old St. Cloud University professor Edward Anthony Ward answered, Jason believed he was a person he had seen pointing the tan rifle at him earlier. Jason pulled out a pistol and fired two shots at Edward as he attempted to slam the door shut, hitting him in the chest and abdomen. In pain, he yelled out for help. At around 6.16am, emergency services responded to a call shots fired at the address. Edward was able to provide a detailed description of the suspect before being sedated and rushed to the hospital, but died three hours later. At around 7.17am, Jason was arrested after he was found wandering the streets about one and a half miles away on the St. Cloud State Campus. He had a handgun on him that had previously been stolen and cartridges that were consistent with other evidence found at the scene of the shooting. While in custody, the authorities said that Jason made spontaneous utterances including that people killed his family, and he struggled with addiction. Jason also had a prior felony conviction, and has also been barred from possessing firearms. He was charged with murder and a string of other indictable offences. Investigators said there's no clear evidence to indicate any connection between him and Edward, believing the attack to be a random one. Jason appeared in court on the 22nd of June, where he's instructed to undergo a competency examination, before a decision is made on his next court appearance on the 10th of August. Two South Carolina parents have been arrested after cocaine was found on bottles used for a four-month-old baby who died from ingesting the drug. The incident occurred on the 2nd of May, located at 132 Duckbill Road in Prosperity, after paramedics responded to a call of a four-month-old baby not breathing. The unresponsive infant was transported to Newberry Hospital, where it was pronounced dead. During an investigation into the child's death, toxicology reports show that the infant had measurable levels of cocaine in its body, as well as in the child's feeding bottles. Their parents, 18-year-old Brady Lyndon Warren and 17-year-old Mary Catherine Biedenbaugh, underwent a drug screen and they tested positive for cocaine, fentanyl and marijuana. After completing an autopsy as well as using the evidence collected at the crime scene, authorities determined that the child's sudden unexpected death was a result of the baby ingesting cocaine. The matter was ruled a homicide and both parents have been charged with offences relating to the child's death. Both are being held at the Newberry County Detention Centre. The bond hearing was scheduled for the 24th of June as the investigation into the matter continues. A woman has died after her husband viciously beat her over the head with a crowbar while waiting for a bus in Manhattan, New York. The incident occurred at 7am on the 14th of June along West 163rd Street and Fort Washington Avenue. 63-year-old Julio Oponte approached his 49-year-old wife Maria Kelly. He was sitting at a bus stop. He said to her, How dare you cheat on me? As she stood up, the enraged Julia repeatedly struck her in the head with a crowbar. As she lay unconscious on the ground, 
He continued to bash her head in. Horrified onlookers contacted the authorities. Julia fled the crime scene on his motorbike and stopped a short time later. He dumped the bike and he came across a parking attendant. He told the attendant he killed his wife, who urged Julio to contact the police. He then rang 911 and turned himself in, claiming he attacked her because she cheated on him. First responders arrived at the scene and found Maria laying on the ground with severe head trauma and she was rushed to a local hospital. Investigators found a crowbar at the crime scene, wrapped in plastic, as well as Julio's backpack. The brutal attack left Maria with critical skull fractures. She suffered multiple heart attacks from the trauma and succumbed to her injuries four days later. Julio was held in custody without bail and is now looking to have his attempted murder charge upgraded to murder. Julio has a history of violence towards women. In a previous marriage in the Dominican Republic, he stalked his wife, threatened her on multiple occasions and once went after her with an axe. Neighbours have said that Julio was a heavy drinker, while Maria was a devoted mother to a teenage son. A teenage boy has been charged with the stabbing murder of his mother's landlord. The incident occurred on the 20th of June at around 10.49pm, when the authorities received a call relating to a stabbing incident at the home located at 235 Ashbury Court in Dallas, Georgia. When deputies arrived at the scene, they found the homeowner, 58-year-old Brian Allen Johns, clinging to life and suffering from multiple stab wounds. They immediately attempted CPR on him, but a short time later, when paramedics arrived, he was already dead. After further investigation into the matter, deputies determined that the homeowner and the suspect got into a physical altercation. The suspect, 17-year-old Elijah Harris, allegedly stabbed Johns multiple times in the midst of a dispute. According to the authorities, Harris and his mother rented the basement apartment from Johns. The authorities haven't commented on the nature of the argument. Harris has been charged with murder and aggravated assault. He's been taken into custody and he's been held at the Paulding County Jail without bond. A Houston, Texas woman who went to answer the door was shot in the face. The authorities are looking whoever is responsible for shooting the woman in her apartment. The incident occurred just after 9pm on Monday when officers responded to the shooting call at the 10,000 block of Buffalo Speedway. First responders found a woman with gunshot wounds to her face, including her chin and neck. She was rushed to the local hospital where she underwent surgery but is expected to survive. Evidence was collected from the crime scene. The authorities said the woman was with a man who were both inside the apartment when they heard a knock at the front door. That's when the woman went to answer the door but was shot multiple times before she could even open the door. The man was not injured in the ordeal. Detectives are investigating the matter and are trying to piece together whether this was a targeted attack. A woman has been arrested after placing a five-year-old child into the trunk of her car. The incident occurred just after 2pm on the 4th of August, located along the 1900 block of North Norwood Avenue in Pueblo, Colorado. A bystander noticed a woman yelling at a young boy and shoving him into the trunk of her car. A bystander records the event on her phone and starts arguing with the woman. She says you can't put the child in the trunk. The woman replies yes I can, but soon pops the trunk open and releases the child. She then approaches the bystander, saying that she'll tase her in the face, and that she needs to back up. The authorities were called to the scene, but the woman had left. The woman was identified as 33-year-old Chelsea Trujillo. The authorities said that Chelsea and the child are homeless. In the afternoon of the following day, the police located the pair at East 12th Street, where the boy was said to be in good health and unharmed. Chelsea was arrested on a string of offences, including abuse of a child and violation of a restraining order. She's currently being held at the Pueblo County Jail on a $26,000 bond. The child was placed into the care of the Colorado Department of Human Services. A Marion County man has been charged with involuntary manslaughter after his dog mauled a seven-year-old boy to death. The attack occurred on the 13th of June, while seven-year-old Shamar Jackson went for a walk with his brother, looking for their pet chihuahua dog named Remy, 
after it escaped from their home. While walking, they found Remy at the corner of Cleo and Wilbur Roads. The brothers called for Remy to come to them when a pack of mixed breed dogs that escaped from a neighbor's property started surrounding the small dog. These dogs had a history of escaping and intimidating others. They saw the brothers. The eldest jumped a fence and managed to escape. Shamar, however, jumped on the fence but fell back and one of the dogs started attacking him. The dog tore through all of Shamar's clothing and killed him. The authorities visited the gruesome scene and removed five adult dogs and a puppy from the property responsible. The owner of the dogs, 41-year-old Lorenzo Cadanus, has been charged with involuntary manslaughter and penalty for an owner of a dangerous animal that attacks and injures a human. His bond hearing is due on the 30th of June. 28-year-old Sandra Chico has been arrested on murder charges in connection to the deaths of her three kids. The incident occurred around 12.45pm on the 28th of June when the authorities arrived at a home at 630 South Ferris Avenue in Los Angeles, California. There they found two boys and a girl, all aged four years and under, unresponsive and not breathing in the bedroom. Despite applying life-saving measures, all were pronounced dead before 1pm. Sandra was taken into custody for questioning immediately after their deaths. Authorities said there's no history of calls made to the home. The cause of death has not officially been disclosed, but family members say Sandra suffocated them and then tried to kill herself. The children's paternal grandmother said the father was at work during the incident. She also said that Sandra was suffering from depression. Sandra was originally held on a $2 million bail, but after a first court appearance on the 30th of June, this was increased to $6 million. She's been charged with three counts of assault and murder as the investigation into the matter continues. An Arkansas woman was asleep Tuesday morning when a six-year-old son left their house and drowned in a river nearby. The incident occurred on the 29th of June when 25-year-old Sarah Brashears contacted the Galen County Sheriff's Office to report a son missing. She said she woke up at her home, located at 361 Vanadium Circle in Hot Springs National Park, when her son had disappeared. Deputies responded to the home at around 10.51am, located along the Washita River. They made contact with a neighbour nearby, who had security camera footage of the six-year-old walking near the home, towards the river. The authorities began patrolling the waterline and located the boy's body. They retrieved him and began CPR but he was unable to be resuscitated and he was pronounced dead. Sarah consented to a drug screen where she tested positive for meth. State authorities took her two older sons, both aged seven, into custody. She was arrested and booked into the Galen County Jail at 4.43 p.m. that day. She's held without bail on three charges of endangering the welfare of a minor. A woman has been arrested after fatally shooting her husband and wounding another woman after a night of heavy drinking. It all started when 74-year-old Cheryl Grabe and her husband 75-year-old Kenneth Grabe started drinking early on Tuesday the 27th of July at the home located at 92 Hoses Road in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They had a friend, 53-year-old Stephanie Sloan joined them for some heavy drinking who arrived at the couple's home at around 3.30pm. The couple hadn't seen Sloan for about two years because of COVID. A little later, two other men came to the home and the five of them consumed multiple bottles of wine. When it was just the couple left in the house, Stephanie went into one of the bedrooms alone and removed all the clothes to get ready for bed. Ken then entered the room and began to caress her and touched her inappropriately. She asked him, what are you doing and where is your wife? At that moment, Ken yelled out for Cheryl who entered the room. Upset, Cheryl reached for a revolver and shot Ken in the back and struck Stephanie in the right shoulder. Ken fell forward and collapsed on top of Stephanie. Stephanie pushed Ken off her and escaped through a guest room bathroom window. She soon re-entered the premises to retrieve her clothes before heading to a neighbor's place for help where she contacted 911 at around 1.15 a.m. The authorities arrived at the crime scene at around 1.39 a.m. that night. Cheryl refused to respond to officers' demands and remained inside the home, so a SWAT team was called in at around 2.30am. A few hours later, she surrendered peacefully. Inside the home, they found Ken's lifeless body, laying on the living room floor. 
He had a single gunshot wound to his back, and his right arm was slung over the coffee table. There was a revolver nearby, and multiple wine bottles scattered around the house. Blood was also found on the sheets of the bed in the master bedroom, with trails of blood also leading into the living room and guest room, where a bathroom window was open and the screen had been removed. Stephanie was taken to a local medical centre and was treated for a gunshot wound. She also suffered multiple bruises and abrasions on her arms and legs. Cheryl, who was heavily intoxicated, was taken into custody and questioned by investigators. She said she had little memory of the shooting, other than drinking with her friends. She also said she didn't realise they were coming over and never got to cook for them or eat. She was told her husband was dead and she nodded and asked for an attorney. Cheryl is held at the Santa Fe County Adult Detention Facility without bond. She's charged with murder, aggravated assault and negligent use of a deadly weapon as the investigation into the matter continues. A woman has been charged with murder after allegedly shooting her ex-husband in the head and burying his body in the backyard. 40-year-old Corinna Herr of 1167 Kennard Street in St. Paul, Minnesota was arrested on the 29th of July after the body of her 50-year-old ex-husband, Ko Yang, was found wrapped in tarp beneath a newly built shed in the backyard. Ko's body was discovered weeks after a neighbour contacted the authorities in early July to report a foul-smelling odour coming from Karina's backyard. On the 22nd of July, a 911 caller requested a welfare check for Ko, saying that he hadn't been seen for the last few weeks. Karina, who lived in the same home as Ko, despite being divorced, also rang the police the same day to say that she hadn't seen him since the 1st of July. Ko's 17-year-old stepdaughter also called the authorities to report that she suspects that Karina killed him. She told the police that on the 2nd of July, she found a hole in the backyard that had been covered up with a tarp-like item. Karina later built a shed over the hole. After a search warrant was issued, police brought cadaver dogs onto the property on the 29th of July that reacted to a shed in the yard with possible signs of decomposition or blood. The police also found blood on a bedroom wall that was recently painted inside the couple's residence, as well as in the garage and laundry room. Karina was taken into custody and interviewed. She told the investigators that Ko had gone to Oklahoma to visit relatives and said that the hole in the yard was from a tree stump that she removed. She also blamed the foul smell on the property on pigeons that were kept in a nearby coop. On the 31st of July, the investigators found Ko's body beneath the shed. According to a medical examiner's report, he had been shot twice in the back of the head. Karina has been charged with murder and is held on a $2 million bail. A Tennessee man is in custody and is facing criminal charges after holding his mother down and beating her repeatedly. At around 3.55am on the 30th of June, the authorities responded to the Fort Sanders Regional Medical Center in relation to a 54-year-old woman admitted there after being assaulted at a home located at 2300 Coca Avenue in Knoxville, Tennessee. The victim had been brought to the emergency room by her son, identified as 31-year-old Justin Lee Roberts. His mother was suffering from numerous major injuries, including fractures to her face and bleeding to her brain, and was transferred to the UT Medical Center due to the severity of her injuries. Deputies were initially told several different accounts of how the assault allegedly occurred. However, through further investigation and obtaining witness and victim accounts, it was determined that Justin assaulted her. The victim said he held her down by placing his shin on her thighs and repeatedly beat her for hours. Justin is held at the Roger D. Wilson Detention Facility and is charged with attempted second-degree murder and especially aggravated kidnapping. A man has been taken into custody and charged with multiple offences after breaking into a home and attempting to kidnap a young girl. The incident occurred around 10.40pm on the 30th of June in the 1200 block of Northwest 13th Street in Lincoln City, Oregon. 33-year-old Joshua Hawkins got into the home through an unlocked front door and was in the kitchen when the family's 10-year-old daughter walked in. He then grabbed the girl and told her she was a victim of human trafficking and was going to take her away from there. The girl broke free and ran to her parents. The girl's father was able to physically detain the intruder until police arrived. The authorities said he had burglary tools and several hard plastic zip ties that were about 18 inches long. 
They said he appeared to be under the influence of drugs, so they took him to the Samaritan North Lincoln Hospital to be checked out. After doctors cleared him, a deputy was taking Joshua back to a patrol car when he somehow got out of the handcuffs and started fighting with the officer in the emergency room parking lot. With the help of an emergency room staff member, police got Joshua into custody and no one was injured in the ordeal. Joshua faces charges of burglary, attempted kidnapping, possession of burglary tools, attempting to escape, resisting arrest and disorderly conduct. A Missouri man was found guilty on Thursday of attacking a McDonald's manager with a rake after his daughter was fired from a job for wearing incorrect work attire and using inappropriate language in front of customers. The incident occurred on the 9th of January 2019 when the ex-employee's father, 38-year-old Kendall Cooks, and several others drove two vehicles to the McDonald's outlet in Chesterfield, Missouri, 90 minutes after the dismissal to confront the manager Jeffrey Jackson. Cooks then spotted Jackson inside his Honda CRV during his break and blocked him in. Jackson refused to talk to Cooks, which infuriated him, so he picked up a five foot long wood and a metal rake he found from a nearby dumpster and began smashing the driver's side window of the vehicle. He then proceeded to beat him repeatedly in the head and arms with the rake. Part of the attack was captured on Jackson's dashboard camera and evidence from photos showed glass and blood inside the victim's vehicle and Cooks was arrested. Jackson was hospitalized for a week following the attack. He lost one eye that was replaced with a prosthetic one and he underwent five surgeries to repair his vision to his other eye. Cooks told the investigators that Jackson pushed his daughter out the door of the fast food restaurant after he sacked her. After viewing surveillance footage from inside the McDonald's, it showed that the only contact between Jackson and Cooks' daughter was after the manager slipped and nobody was shoved. Cooks has been charged with assault, armed criminal action, and a felony count of property damage and faces up to 30 years in prison. His sentencing is scheduled for the 11th of August. A gunman shot a couple at the downtown aquarium restaurant in Houston, Texas, killing a man and injuring a woman before taking his own life. The incident occurred around 8.10pm, located at 810 Bagby Street, when officers responded to the shooting on the second floor of the aquarium. The event unfolded when 29-year-old Gabriel Vargas and his 24-year-old wife were at the restaurant bar having dinner during their visit to Houston from New York, when the suspect, who was sitting at the opposite end of the bar, got up and went over to the area where the couple were and started firing shots at them before turning the gun on himself. The gunman was later identified as 39-year-old Danny Gazaras and Vargas was pronounced dead on the scene. Vargas's wife was shot in the leg and was transported to the hospital in a stable condition. The authorities believe that the shooting to be a random incident where the couple were unfamiliar with Gazaras. Gazaras was sitting at the bar by himself, drinking for several hours before the shooting occurred. The couple shared several pictures and a video of their visit to the restaurant on social media. In one video, Kazaris could be seen just a few feet away from the couple at the bar. Kazaris was out on bond for a gun charge back in April after his niece called police to a restaurant saying he was high on meth and had a pistol. The authorities arrested him when he was seated at a bar with a loaded pistol in his pocket. In October of 2020, he was charged with criminal mischief for trashing a motel room. He told the investigators that he thought someone was inside the room, so he trashed it while trying to find the person. On Christmas Eve, he was found wandering around a fire department's bunkhouse. He was arrested and charged with criminal trespass. The authorities said that Kazaris has a history of mental illness. A man has been arrested after parents of a five-year-old girl restrained the man with duct tape after he broke into their daughter's bedroom. The incident occurred around 5am on the 6th of July when a pervert, later identified as a registered offender, 39-year-old David Dietz, started creeping around the outside of a home located in Grayson, California. He first knocked on the door and then he tried to open it. The parents of the residence then saw the man peering inside the living room window, showing his private parts and touching himself, repeatedly saying I love you. The girl's father confronted the stranger and told him to leave, but he didn't listen. The parents then lost sight of the man as he went around to the other side of the house when they heard a loud sound. The man removed the screen to the window of a five-year-old girl's bedroom before crawling inside. The man then turned on the light. That's when the little girl woke up to the exposed stranger in front of her and became frightened. 
The father rushed into the room and pulled the man outside, where he wrestled him and pinned him to the ground. He and his wife then restrained him using duct tape, called 911, and waited for the officers to arrive. Diaz was convicted of assault with intent to commit a lewd act in 2009, and was released in 2018. Diaz was arrested and charged with child endangerment, home invasion, and peeping and prowling. He's been held on a $150,000 bond. A man has been arrested and charged with offences relating to violent and lewd acts he committed against a woman he lived with. The incident occurred on Tuesday the 6th of July when the victim had work colleagues over at the farmstead drive home in Aiken County, South Carolina. When 44-year-old Alvin Crew got home, he was furious, leading to a violent evening after a fellow employee's left. Crew was particularly upset that she had male colleagues over at the house for several hours. Alone at the house, Crew punched her in the head multiple times and kicked her when she tried to run away, injuring her head, ribs and arms. Crew then forced her to strip her clothes off and stand in the middle of a tile shower as he pointed a gun at her and belittled her. Crew then shot one round into the shower that the victim occupied, which struck just in front of the victim's feet. He later forced her to perform an oral act on him as he sat in bed with a gun right beside him. The woman's co-workers rang the police when the victim called them the following day to say she wasn't coming in. They said that was unusual for her, and they wanted the police to do a welfare check. When the deputies arrived at the couple's home, Crew saw them and tried to hide behind the garage doors. They found the victim so scared that she asked the deputies to leave before they finally separated the couple and took Crew away in handcuffs. That's when she told them what happened. The investigators found a bullet hole in the shower, as well as marijuana paraphernalia, and an AR-15 loaded full of ammunition. The victim had bruising to the left side of her face, and felt like she may have had a possible broken rib and a broken finger. She said her family would take her to the hospital. Crew was charged with criminal lewd conduct, domestic violence, kidnapping, pointing and presenting firearms at a person, possession of a weapon during violent crime, and a related weapons offence. A woman is facing murder and felony abuse charges after locking her two daughters in a hot bedroom where a five-year-old child died and a two-year-old sister was rescued. The 23-year-old mother, Kamala Taylor, had been acting strange and a friend of hers became concerned when she received a text from her that she perceived as a vague suicidal threat. That friend requested a welfare check on her on the 16th of June. The authorities went to the home located at 10,256 Missouri Meadows Street in Las Vegas, Nevada, but they couldn't locate her or the children. On the 26th of June, the neighbors also noticed that Taylor was acting peculiar. At one point, she sat in the driveway holding her children wrapped in blankets in the middle of a hot day. She'd also been seen throwing rocks at vehicles and breaking a truck's window with a KitchenAid mixer. At 7 p.m. on the 28th of June, the authorities received a report of a disturbance at the address and two deputies managed to make contact with Taylor and found the home to be in complete disarray. She was acting weird and appeared to be suffering from some sort of mental illness. The officers took Taylor into custody and began searching the house and came across a locked bedroom door upstairs. They then kicked the door open and discovered Taylor's daughters inside. The two-year-old was standing next to a bed while the five-year-old was laying unresponsive on it. One of the deputies began CPR on her until the paramedics arrived, but to no avail and she was pronounced dead. The authorities noted that the air conditioning in the house was not on, and the temperature in the bedroom felt far warmer than the rest of the residence. While the home's thermostat read 95 degrees, the temperature in the room was 108 degrees. In addition, a humidifier was turned on to the maximum position. After Taylor was put in the back of the patrol car, she began making utterances including it was a necessary sacrifice and insisted on being taken to a mental institution. Neighbors also told police they overheard her say I killed it and claimed to be the son of Jacob. The landlord said Taylor struggled financially and failed to pay the rent in June. Taylor faces a murder charge along with two counts of felony abuse. Her younger daughter was taken by Child Protective Services. She's scheduled in court on the 15th of July. A Utah man has been charged with aggravated abuse after deliberately leaving a disabled woman locked in a hot car. 
66-year-old Richard Young got into an argument with the victim, whose name's been suppressed, in Murray City on Friday the 9th of July. Upset, Richard turned off the car, took his keys out, and said have a nice life as he walked away, leaving the woman with no way of getting out of the vehicle. The outdoor temperature was 101 degrees. The woman was in the car for 15 to 20 minutes with the windows rolled up, and it was becoming extremely hot inside the car. The woman became paralyzed from the heat as she suffers from multiple sclerosis, which Richard was well aware of. The local fire department was called and helped to get out of the car. She was given a drink, a wet towel, and ice packs to cool down. Richard has been charged with aggravated abuse of a disabled adult. Parents in Tazewell County, Virginia, are facing charges after their infant son died of a drug overdose. On the 22nd of April this year, 28-year-old Kayla Stanford and 30-year-old Evan Stanford of Baptist Valley Road brought their four-month-old boy to a hospital where he was later pronounced dead. The medical examiner found suboxone and methadone in the infant system. The cause of death was determined to be the toxic effects of both substances. Both parents admitted to having suboxone residues on their hands and touching the infant's face and mouth. An interview was conducted with a witness who advised that she had seen methadone delivered to Kayla just three weeks prior to his death. The parents stated the baby had been in their room with them from the time he went to sleep until they found him unresponsive. The infant was solely with the mother and father that day and night, according to the mother. The parents were arrested on the 9th of July and have been charged with involuntary manslaughter and child endangerment, and they're being held without bond at the Southwest Virginia Regional Jail. Two attackers slashed a 61-year-old man after they got into an argument with him in New York. The incident occurred around 9.40am on the 12th of July, when the man got into a dispute with the pair at the corner of Valentine Avenue and East 204th Street in the Jerome Park section of the Bronx. As the fight escalated, the two started attacking the man and slashed him with an unknown object. The two attackers fled the scene in a black Honda Civic after the assault. The 61-year-old man was taken to a local hospital where he was treated and released. The attackers are on the loose and are wanted by the authorities. A Baltimore County woman faces a string of charges, including two counts of abuse, resulting in the death of two children, after the decomposing remains of a young niece and nephew were found in the trunk of a car during a late traffic stop. The deaths came to light on the 28th of July this year, after 33-year-old Nicole Johnson was pulled over for speeding in a car. She was stopped at around 11.17pm that night on the corner of Eastern Boulevard and Wagner's Lane in Essex, Maryland. During the traffic stop, the officer noticed that Nicole had no license, no insurance, and was using fake temporary tags. Nicole was issued with numerous traffic citations and was told that her car had to be towed. She also got told that she would need to appear in court in five days' time. Nicole said it didn't matter and that she won't be here in five days and that everyone will see her on the news. As Nicole started removing items from the car's trunk prior to being towed, the officer noticed the unmistakable odour of decomposition. When questioned about the smell, Nicole initially told the officer it was from her dirty blankets because she had been sleeping in the car. The officer was adamant there was something dead inside her bags and asked Nicole to open them. Nicole tried to conceal the contents of her suitcase by turning her back and using the blanket before removing it and exposing the decomposing remains of a child. A tied up clear trash bag was also found to contain crawling maggots inside a decomposing body of a second child. Nicole initially told police that she didn't know that the children had been placed in the trunk of her car. She then went on to say that she thought the smell from a car was coming from a rat in the engine. Both bodies were taken to the state medical examiner's office for autopsies. The authorities said the kids were a seven-year-old niece, Jocelyn Johnson, and a five-year-old nephew, Larry O'Neill. Nicole told police that she started taking care of the kids when her sister, Deshelle Johnson, moved from Ohio to Maryland in July of 2019 because Deshelle wasn't able to provide for them. Deshelle explained to the authorities that she had arranged to have the children return to her in March this year, but Nicole never showed. She was unable to find Nicole or her children until detectives notified her of the children's deaths. The authorities believe that the little girl may have been dead since last year. Nicole told police that in May of 2020, while staying at an inn off Pulaski Highway in Rosedale, she became angry when Jocelyn started misbehaving. 
so she hit her several times. As she fell, she hit her head on the floor, causing her to die. Nicole then placed Denise's body in a suitcase and carried her remains around in the car for months. She also said that her nephew had an injury two months ago. She explained that he was tired and lay down in the back seat. She recalled seeing blood on his leg, but couldn't elaborate on the injury. She said he never woke up, so she put his body in a plastic bag next to her sister. When the autopsy was completed, it showed the girl weighed 18 pounds, and the boy weighed 21 pounds. The official cause of death has not yet been determined. Doctors said it would have taken months of malnourishment to attain these weights. Baltimore police said it would take time to determine the exact circumstances that led to the children's deaths. Nicole is held at the Baltimore Detention Center without bond as the investigation into the matter continues. A sacked employee at a seafood restaurant returned to the business with a gun, demanded money and shot three employees inside. The incident occurred around 10.15pm on the 26th of July at the Fish House North located at 4554 North Tryon Street in Charlotte, North Carolina. The authorities arrived at the scene of the reported robber in shooting, where they found three employees inside with gunshot wounds. All three people were transported to a local hospital with minor injuries. The employees provided a description of the suspect, saying a former worker, identified as Robert Barringer, pulled a handgun inside the restaurant and fired the weapon, striking one person, and then proceeded to shoot two more people working inside. During the ordeal, Barringer reportedly demanded money and property from the restaurant and then ran away from the building. Two days later, he was apprehended and held in custody at the Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Office. He's been charged with three counts of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill and inflict serious injury, three counts of robbery with a dangerous weapon, three counts of shooting into an occupied property, first degree kidnapping and firearm by a felon. The investigation into the matter continues. A woman has been charged with concealing her mother's death by burying her in the backyard after she died. At 4.25pm on the 3rd of June, deputies arrived at a home for a medical call located at 1778 Tobacco Road in Augusta, Georgia. Inside the residence, they found 43-year-old Melissa Lockhart with a broken right knee and she was taken to the Augusta University Medical Center for treatment. While at the property, deputies spotted a freshly dug shallow grave in the backyard, where they found the remains of Melissa's 67-year-old mother, Miriam Lockhart. Melissa said she found her mother dead in her bed about two to three days earlier, and didn't want anyone to take her mother's body and cut her up to perform an autopsy, so she buried her in the backyard. The mother and daughter lived at the home together, and Melissa was a primary caregiver. An autopsy for Miriam has been completed, but the results are still not known. Neighbours also witnessed hearing people fighting at the home in the weeks leading up to the discovery of Miriam's body. Police responded to the home earlier in February and found Miriam was having trouble breathing. When they arrived, Miriam told deputies she was scared of her daughter. She claimed her daughter yelled at her and worried Melissa would hit or kill her. She also told the officers that she was incapacitated and hadn't left the house for years. Melissa denied the accusations and claimed her mother yelled at her. Deputies didn't see any physical injuries on either woman at the time and reported the incident to Adult Protective Services. Melissa's been charged with concealing her mother's death along with a probation violation and a bond has been set at $6,520.50. A woman stabbed her 10-month-old baby son to death and critically injured her 8-year-old daughter at their home. The incident occurred on Monday night on the 10th of May, located at Hilltop Drive in Newport News in Virginia. The authorities received a call of a woman in distress. When the police arrived at the house, they found an 8-year-old girl and a 10-month-old boy with multiple stab wounds. The authorities initially received a call from the baby's father, who told them his fiancée, 35-year-old Sarah Ganu, was acting erratically. She had texted him with a disturbing message about what he'll find when he got home. Sarah told him not to be sad, but the house would be bloody when he got home. Howard left work and called 911 on the way home. He reached his residence before the police and the medics. Upon arrival, her husband noticed vast amounts of blood in numerous locations. He found Sarah and the two children laying on the bed in the master bedroom. 
The baby was dead from multiple stab wounds. The eight-year-old daughter suffered 50 stab wounds throughout her body, which were life-threatening. But amazingly, she survived the horrific ordeal and is doing better after being flown to a hospital for treatment. The mother had superficial stab wounds. She was arrested and treated for her injuries and then taken into custody. When detectives interviewed her, she admitted to stabbing her children multiple times with a knife. She complained of bruising to her right hand and arm which was caused by hammering the knife during the stabbing. Sarah also had a bite mark to her right forearm from her daughter while she attempted to break free. Sarah was charged with second degree murder, aggravated malicious wounding, two counts of felony child abuse and two counts of using a knife in a felony. She's now been held without bond as she awaits trial. 37-year-old Ryan Bliston of Oroville, California, was charged on the 12th of May for a series of attacks involving hacking the throats of people, with three being fatal last year. In May and June of 2020, Ryan worked for a tree trimming business in Butte and Tahama counties, which is north of Sacramento. After finishing the jobs, he returned to the client's homes before slashing the throats of the residents. On the 18th of May last year, he forced his way into a couple's home and attacked them. 88-year-old Lorraine Severs of Los Molinos died, but her husband, 91-year-old Homer Severs, survived the horrific attack, but passed away in December from an unrelated illness. After having completed tree trimming for 82-year-old Sandra George on the 4th of June, Bliston returned and entered her home and fatally slashed her throat. Two days later in the evening, 57-year-old Vicky Klein was an acquaintance of Blinston, was seen both together in the downtown of Oroville. An arson fire destroyed a car later that day, and she also went missing. The contained blood and DNA evidence found inside the torch car forensically matched that of Klein. Just before daybreak on the 14th of June 2020, a SWAT team managed to track Blinston down to a motorhome in a heavily forested and isolated region of Berry Creek planning on arresting him on suspicion of torching Klein's car. As the team approached the motorhome, they heard muffled screams of a man inside and loud banging on the outside of the motorhome. The banging turned out to be Blinston attempting to get into the motorhome with a hatchet. When confronted by the authorities, Blinston fled into the woods and refused to drop the hatchet. A taser gun and pepper spray were used on him and there was a brief struggle before he was subdued and taken into custody. The owner of the motorhome was a 50-year-old man who explained to the authorities that he had met Blinston earlier and allowed him to stay because he was afraid to leave after dark because of the bears. He told the authorities that he was sleeping when he awoke and found Blinston attacking him with a knife. He slashed his throat before he managed to kick him out of the motorhome and lock the door. A medic treated the seriously wounded man and he was airlifted to a hospital. Blinston pleaded not guilty to attempted murder in that case last year. On the 21st of June 2020, Vicky Klein's body was found by a fisherman in the Feather River near Belden. Her throat was slashed, and the blood and DNA found in his car matched back to that of Klein. There was no immediate word on the motive of the crimes. On Wednesday the 12th of May 2021, 37-year-old Ryan Scott Blinston was charged with murder, attempt to murder an arson. He faces the possibility of life in jail as the trial continues. 27-year-old Tyler Rios has been arrested and charged with kidnapping his two-year-old son Sebastian Rios, who's been found alive. He's also been charged with kidnapping the mother of his child, 24-year-old Yasmin Uya, who's been found dead. The drama unfolded when the authorities issued an Amber Alert on the afternoon on the 9th of July, after the toddler didn't shop for daycare and Yasmin didn't shop for work in the state of New Jersey. Yasmin had a restraining order against Tyler, who had a history of abusing her and was out on probation. Given Tyler's violent past, he was a prime suspect in their disappearance, so they began a nationwide search for his car. Early the following morning, officers from the Monterey Police Department spotted his silver Ford Fiesta, parked at the Bethel Inn Hotel near Interstate 40, along East Stratton Avenue, in Monterey, Tennessee. Officers made contact with Tyler, and tried to convince him to give up and exit his room. After refusing to do so, they forced their way into the hotel room, where they found the toddler unharmed, and Tyler was taken into custody. Tyler was questioned about Yasmin, who led the investigators to a wooded area on Highway 17 Monterey, where he left her dead body. Tyler's been charged with kidnapping, 
Additional charges are expected in connection with Yasmin's death. He's been held in custody in Tennessee and is waiting extradition to New Jersey. Two brothers have been charged in the fatal shooting of 29-year-old police officer Ella French, who was killed during a traffic stop and critically wounding one other. The incident occurred just before 9pm on the 7th of August. Located in the 6300 block of South Bell Avenue in West Englewood, 22-year-old Eric Morgan was driving a car with expired tags with his younger brother 21-year-old Imonti Morgan, who was a passenger and was in possession of a semi-automatic pistol. Ella's 39-year-old on-duty partner demanded Imonti to get out of the car and a physical altercation ensued. Ella rushed to her partner's aid and Imonti opened fire. He fatally shot her and struck her partner three times, critically injuring him. Ella's partner was admitted to the ICU, fighting for his life, but his condition has been improving each day. Imonti is charged with first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, aggravated unlawful use of a weapon, and unlawful use of a weapon by a felon. His brother Eric, who was driving the car, also faces charges. During a bail hearing on the 10th of August, both brothers were denied bail. A young woman who was in the front passenger seat has not been charged as the investigation into the matter continues. The authorities are searching for a suspect who walked up behind 42-year-old Delia Johnson and fatally shot her in the back of the head. The brazen incident, which was captured on video, occurred on the 4th of August, just after 9.30pm on the 600 block of Franklin Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. The video shows the blonde suspect, thought to be in her mid-twenties, exiting a double-parked white sedan and casually walking up to her unsuspecting victim. She then raises a gun before executing Delia with a bullet to the back of the head. She then returns to her vehicle and flees the scene. First responders found Delia laying unconscious and unresponsive with gunshot wounds to her head and leg. She was rushed to the Interfaith Hospital, where she was pronounced dead. Family members say Johnson was at a funeral early in the day, and the suspect was also there, but there was no interaction between the pair. Her family believe that she was set up because she received a call later that day to go to Franklin Avenue, which is just a few blocks from her home. No arrests have been made, and the investigation is ongoing. A 73-year-old grandmother was arrested earlier this week after picking up a grandson from a scene of a fatal hit-and-run earlier this year. The incident occurred around 1am on the 14th of January. 22-year-old Hunter Johnson was driving a pickup truck southbound on the Hale Boggs Bridge in Destrehan, Louisiana, where there was active roadworks going on at the time. Hunter lost control and struck multiple vehicles and 44-year-old construction worker Brady Ortigo he was thrown off the bridge and into the Mississippi River below. Hunter then fled on foot and left his pickup truck on the shoulder of Interstate 310. He then called his grandmother immediately after to collect him. Ortigo's body has not been found despite extensive search and rescue efforts. On the 12th of March, Hunter surrendered himself to state troopers who had a warrant for his arrest. He's facing charges which include vehicular homicide, driving under the influence, hit and run driving involving a fatality, reckless operation and obstruction of justice charges. Through further investigative work, the authorities learnt that Hunter contacted his grandmother, 73-year-old Marie Dufresne, after the accident. On the 5th of July, at around 7am, the authorities arrested Marie at her residence. After investigators determined that she collected Hunter after he fled on foot following the crash, which prevented the police from making an arrest at the time and she's been charged with obstruction of justice. Both Hunter and Marie are held in custody at the Nelson Coleman Correction Centre in St. Charles Parish, as the investigation into the matter continues. A 46-year-old woman was arrested seven minutes after robbing a bank. The incident occurred on the 5th of July at 9.51am when the authorities received a call of a robbery at PNC Bank on Russellville Road in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Seven minutes later, 46-year-old Rachel Lowe was arrested for the crime. A police officer was in the area of the bank when the call came in. He got the suspect's description and arrested Rachel as she walked down Russellville Road. 
When Rachel was questioned why she thought she was being stopped, she responded by saying, because I just robbed a bank. She explained that she entered the bank and handed a teller a note saying, this is a robbery, $50,000. The teller then handed some money over and she left. The deputy found $240 in Rachel's purse and a notebook that matched the note she handed to the teller. Bank staff told police that at one time during the robbery, Rachel said she had a gun. Rachel said she was afraid she was going to lose her home and needed the money to avoid becoming homeless. Rachel was taken to the Warren County Regional Jail, charged with first degree robbery. A peeping Tom who was shot is facing criminal charges. The incident occurred around 2.30am on the 28th of June, along the 15,400 block in West Little York Road in Houston, Texas, when 44-year-old Jorge Ramos tapped on a window of a 10-year-old girl. When the girl looked over to see who it was, she saw a man loitering at the front of their home, performing a lewd act on himself while staring back at her. The little girl screamed, causing her parents to rush outside with guns to confront the pervert. The father ordered the man to lay down on the yard until police arrived, but he didn't comply and fled across the road to a Valero gas station. There, the girl's mother held him at gunpoint as the father headed inside the gas station to ask the store clerk to call 911. The suspect bear hugged the woman and disarmed her gun and pointed it back in her direction. The suspect tried pulling the trigger, but the gun safety switch was on. Fearing for his wife's safety, the husband came rushing out and fired at the suspect, shooting him three times in the torso. Paul Hayes been charged with indecency with a child by exposure and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He was taken to the Memorial Hermann Hospital, where he's in a critical but stable condition, where he's recuperating as the investigation into the matter continues. A 37-year-old man has been arrested and charged with murdering his girlfriend after he confessed to his mother who then contacted the police. The call was made at around 8.30pm on the 25th of September and an officer was dispatched to the couple's residence on State Highway 98 near Keen Road in Lakeland. When a deputy arrived at the couple's RV, he made contact with the suspect outside who provided a false name and date of birth. He attempted to arrest the suspect but a struggle ensued. Jason removed the officer's stun gun and radio and attempted to choke him. Two witnesses came to the deputy's aid and helped secure Jason in handcuffs. Deputies who arrived to provide backup found the girlfriend's body buried beneath a pallet, topped with freshly disturbed dirt, a table and two chairs. Authorities have not released the girlfriend's name. Jason was taken into custody and charged with murder, as well as a slew of other undoubtable offences. Jason has an extensive criminal history. Prior to the Lotus arrest, his record includes 19 felonies and been imprisoned four times. He was most recently released in January of 2021. A Florida man who wanted to clear his conscience confessed to murdering a woman a decade ago. On the afternoon on the 29th of September, 43-year-old Benjamin Moulton walked into the Manatee County Sheriff's Office and admitted to murdering 29-year-old Nicole Rose Scott in 2011. He told the investigators that he had found Jehovah and couldn't live with the guilt anymore. In December of 2011, Nicole's lifeless and partially clad body was discovered by a motorist at the end of University Boulevard in the Lakewood Ranch area. She had been strangled and had visible trauma to her face. Her body had likely been dumped in the remote wooded area several days before her body was found. At the time of the murder, investigators interviewed Ben regarding his connection with Nicole. However, detectives were unable to compile enough evidence to link him to the crime. The case went cold after several years with no leads. After confessing to the investigators, Ben told them that he killed her in a fit of rage and provided other details about the case that were never released to the public and only stuff that he would know if he had been out there. He was taken into police custody and was charged with Nicole's murder. A Texas teenager has been charged with murdering his sister after allegedly stabbing her while he was asleep. The incident occurred just after 2.30am on the 29th of September. Located at the home in the 4100 block of Brown Meadow Court in Katy, 17-year-old Benjamin Elliott woke up stunned after finding himself in his twin sister Megan Elliot's bedroom. 
To his horror, he found a knife lodged in her neck. After realising that he wasn't dreaming, he removed the knife and turned on the light and placed pressure to the wound with a pillow. He then ran to his bedroom, grabbed a phone and contacted 911. Dispatchers advised Ben how to perform CPR on Megan. Seven minutes into the call, he calls out to his parents, who were heard yelling and crying in the background. When the authorities arrived, they found Megan on the bed, and there was a knife beside her on the ground. She had at least two stab wounds in her neck, and was pronounced dead at the scene. While questioned, Ben reportedly told police that he hasn't suffered from any sleep irregularities, and he didn't consume any drugs or alcohol before going to bed. Ben has been charged with murder, and he's been held at the Harris County Jail on a $100,000 bond. He didn't appear at his first court session, instead he's been assessed by the mental health unit. If he makes bond, he'll be required to wear a GPS monitoring device and give up his passport. He will be tried as an adult. An Arizona woman shot her two young children multiple times, killing one of them. The incident occurred on the 27th of September at around 11.45am when police were called to the home located in South 8th Place, Phoenix. 24-year-old Essa Kiehas shot her two-year-old daughter at close range and then fired at least three shots at her six-year-old son as he ran away from her in their home. When the authorities arrived, they found the young girl unresponsive with her mother. The boy was seen on the floor next to both of them crying and bleeding from the head and torso. Esther told the officers that her kids needed help. One officer picked up the little girl and found that she wasn't breathing and didn't have a pulse. She had blood extended from a gunshot to the chest. A check done on the boy showed gunshot wounds to his head, torso and left arm. Esther was also bleeding from a gunshot wound to her left hand. Officers attempted CPR on the children and were transported to hospital and Esther was arrested. The toddler was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital while the six-year-old boy received surgery, and days later still remains in a critical condition. While questioned, Esther told the authorities that she hid the handgun in the kid's room days before the shooting. She fired a test shot, accidentally hitting herself in the left hand before she turned the gun on the kids. She said she went to shoot herself, but realised that she ran out of bullets, so she attempted to take her own life by overdosing on her antidepressants instead. She then called her husband and sister-in-law to tell them what she had done, who then contacted the police. The authorities said that Esther admitted to the shooting and said she wanted the children to go to heaven. She's been charged with murder and attempted murder. A man has been charged with murder in the beating death of his girlfriend's toddler. 23-year-old Atura Pina Amunza reportedly admitted to investigators that he repeatedly hit two-year-old Jeremiah Rios after having feces wiped on him. Atura had been dating the boy's mother for about a year, and the three lived together in the flat, located in the 300 block of Brown Drive in Irving, Texas. At around 9.30am on the 21st of September, the boy's mother contacted the authorities to request medical assistance after reporting her son was unconscious and unresponsive. When first responders arrived, they found the boy cold to touch and was pronounced dead at the scene. The boy's mother told authorities that her son was asleep 12 hours earlier and checked on him throughout the night, every time he appeared to be sleeping. During the investigation, detectives obtained surveillance footage that showed Arturo leaving the apartment with the child during the night shortly before 3.30am. The man and the boy went and sat in the boy's mother's car for almost an hour. The video later showed the man walking back to the apartment, trying to administer a couple of rescue breaths to the boy, who appeared to be limp. An autopsy indicated that the child suffered multiple blunt force injuries including his head. Otoro was arrested and questioned. He admitted to beating the child to death after he became upset when the toddler put his hands in his soiled diaper and smeared feces on him. He's held at the Dallas County Jail without bail. He's been charged with capital murder and could face the death sentence, or life in prison without the possibility of parole. A 69-year-old woman has been arrested for allegedly shooting her husband in the back while he was serving her divorce papers. On the evening of the 24th of September, the authorities responded to a report of a wounded man near the intersection of East State Highway 21 
and Andert Road in Wixon Valley, Texas. First responders arrived at the scene and found 68-year-old Charles Jerk shot inside his vehicle and was quickly rushed to the local hospital. The staff there contacted the victim's emergency contact, which happened to be his wife Cindy Jerk. During this conversation, Cindy reportedly admitted to shooting her husband. The police went to the home located along Harris Lane, where they learnt that the husband had served Cindy divorce papers earlier that day. It was reported that the couple got into an argument. Upset, Cindy grabbed a gun and told her husband to leave the house. Her husband wasn't leaving fast enough, so Cindy shot him. Cindy has been charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. She's currently been held at the Brazos County Jail on a $30,000 bond. A 32-year-old woman has been charged with murder and attempted murder after she allegedly tossed her young children into a lake. The incident occurred just before 11am on the 24th of September when 32-year-old Eureka Black threw her two boys from a bridge and into the water located at Cross Lake in Shreveport, Louisiana. The authorities received a report of an infant boy's body floating in the lake near Cross Lake Bridge at around 10.52am and deployed its marine unit when the child's lifeless body was retrieved. A five-year-old boy was found floating moments later. The child was transported to the Louisiana State University Medical Center where he is expected to survive. A search for Eureka's third child began. He was later found safe in a different location. Eureka fled the scene in a grey Dodge vehicle with Texas plates. She was spotted at the Louisiana-Texas state line and was apprehended. A couple were behind bars after being found passed out on drugs in a running car with the young children in the back seat. The incident occurred at around 3am on the morning of the 18th of August when officers found 25-year-old Mickey Tut and 26-year-old Olivia McDaniel in the front of a Dodge SUV with the engine running but the lights out. It was parked next to an ATM at Regions Bank located at 7821 Kingston Pike in Knoxville, Tennessee. The pair were passed out high on drugs while the two children, aged two years old and eight months old, sat in the back in child seats. Deputies were eventually able to wake the couple up, but it took multiple attempts. The officers found drug paraphernalia, such as a bong, marijuana grinder, and a used pipe with meth residue on it, in the car which were all in reach of the children. Mickey was so high that he was unable to speak to the deputies, and was taken to the University of Tennessee Medical Center as a precautionary measure. The pair were arrested and charged with a string of drug-related offenses, as well as abuse, neglect, and endangerment of their children. A man has been charged with the murder of two men at a Bedford, New Hampshire hotel. The incident occurred shortly after 7pm on the night of the 21st of August. When the authorities were called to the Country Inn and Suites Hotel at 250 South River Road on reports of two deceased adult males, 42-year-old Theodore Lucky of Asbury Park, New Jersey, was taken into custody and was charged with their murders. He was also charged with three counts of being a felon in possession of a deadly weapon after being found with a machete, pistol and metallic knuckles. The first victim, 28-year-old Nathan Cashman's lifeless body, was found in the hotel lobby. He was left to bleed out after having his head, neck and body hacked with a machete. A witness at the motel said, one man was chasing another man through the hotel. One of the men had a machete and was slashing the other man. The second victim, 60-year-old David Hanford, was found in a hotel guest room and had been strangled to death. The medical examiner ruled both deaths a homicide. A GoFundMe page set up for Nathan's funeral expenses states that he was murdered by a supposed friend. Theodore's currently being held at the Hillsborough County House of Corrections. The authorities have not disclosed the motive of the attack as the investigation into the matter continues. A 1985 cold case in the murder of Leslie McRae has been solved. Leslie was a 17-year-old student at the University of North Florida who had aspirations of one day becoming a model. She shared an apartment with her 21-year-old boyfriend in Jacksonville, Florida. 
On the Christmas Eve of 1985, she was abducted, lewdly assaulted and murdered. The incident occurred at around 3am when Leslie's boyfriend woke up to a man with short brown hair kneeling by his bed. A suspect had a knife and tied him up with neckties. The suspect took Leslie to another room before taking her out the back door. The boyfriend managed to free himself from the restraints and contacted the authorities. Multiple units were dispatched to search for Leslie. A few hours later, her lifeless disrobed body was discovered by passers-by several miles from the apartment in a ditch on the side of the road. She had been beaten, violated and stabbed repeatedly. She had severe wounds on her head and chest and the scene was very bloody. Evidence was collected at the scene, but despite an extensive investigation into the matter, no leads were developed from the evidence and the case went cold. In 2019, relatives of Leslie reached out to the authorities to re-examine the case. In April of 2020, cold case detectives assigned the case, analysed the evidence collected from the crime scene using advanced modern day DNA technology, and they got a hit. The DNA profile matched David Austin, who is now 59 years old and was in the Michigan Corrections Database after being imprisoned in 1991 for lewdly assaulting women in Michigan in 1988. David was interviewed by detectives in April of 2021 and a direct DNA sample was collected from him which reconfirmed the DNA match, linking him to the crime scene. On the 19th of August 2021, the authorities announced they have charged David for Leslie's murder. The investigator said that at the time of her death, David wasn't even on their radar. David stayed in Jacksonville, Florida for a short period of time, but then left the state. He'll be extradited to Florida to face trial. A California woman is facing felony charges after a 14-year-old son shot his half-sibling while in a car she was driving. The incident occurred in San Bernardino when 37-year-old Veronica Pyatt, the teen, and Pyatt's 20-month-old daughter were in the car. While in the back seat of the vehicle, the team was handling a loaded firearm. The gun discharged and wounded the toddler in the thigh. Despite hearing the loud shooting, she kept driving, apparently not realising that her daughter had been shot. As the team took the little girl out of the vehicle and disposed of the firearm, Veronica unloaded the groceries before learning of her daughter's injury. Once all three of them were inside the house, the teen finally told his mother that the baby had been wounded. Hospital staff called the police after Veronica brought the toddler in. The baby was treated for a non-life-threatening injuries. Veronica was arrested on multiple felony charges along with her son. She's held in custody on a $100,000 bond and the charges were not specified. A British woman was sentenced to three years in prison last week after admitting to stabbing a man between the eyes. It all started in the early hours of the 4th of July last year at a man's flat located along Valley Road in Chilwell, Nottingham, England. 28-year-old Brittany Stone, who lived at no fixed address, had been over at the man's place and the pair had been drinking heavily. At some point during the night, the pair got into a heated argument, so the man left to go outside. Upset, Brittany grabbed a knife from the kitchen and followed him. She then thrust the knife between his eyes with so much force it penetrated into his brain, but the enraged woman continued stabbing him in the arm and back. The ferocity of the attack left the man with bleeding to the brain. Brittany was arrested after police arrived, and officers found a knife nearby. The man was rushed to a hospital, where surgeons removed one of his eyes. The victim survived the horrific attack, but now has a false eye. Brittany pleaded guilty in court to the charge of grievous bodily harm with intent. On the 21st of July, she was sentenced to three years in prison. A rapper was killed when he was shot dozens of times, just moments after he was released from the Cook County Jail in Chicago. 31-year-old Andre Sylvester was wearing a monitoring device on his ankle as a condition of his release. He was originally jailed on the 27th of April 2020 for a bail violation for possession of a weapon and resisting arrest. He was due back in court on the 27th of July. About 8.50pm, Londra and a 60-year-old woman who posted a 5k bail for him 
were walking along the 2700 block of West 27th Street in Little Village when several suspects got out of two separate cars across a road and began firing at them. After shooting and striking three people, the gunmen re-entered their vehicles and fled the scene in different directions. Sylvester was struck in the face and chest and was taken to the Mount Sinai Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The woman was struck in the knee and taken to the Stroger Hospital. A 35-year-old woman who worked at the jail, who was walking in the area, suffered a bullet graze to the side of her mouth in the incident. Both women weren't seriously injured and they reported to be in a good condition. The authorities believe that the shooting was a targeted attack on Londre, where the women were inadvertently struck. No arrests have been made to date, but are hoping that the shooters will be identified with surveillance cameras in the area. The New York Police Department are looking for a man, wanted in connection with the stabbing over the weekend. The incident occurred around 8pm on Saturday night, on the 10th of July, when the attacker allegedly walked up to a 27-year-old man playing basketball inside the Luther Gulick Park at Delancey and Columbia Streets in New York City and accused the victim of looking at his girlfriend. The suspect left but returned a short time later and pulled a knife on the victim, telling him he had 10 seconds to leave the park. As he started to count down, he reached seven before he lunged at the victim and stabbed him in the shoulder. The suspect took off and remains at large. The individual is described as an adult male with a medium complexion, approximately five feet seven inches tall, weighing approximately 160 pounds, with a bald head and a scar on the right side of his face. He was last seen wearing a black tank top, black shorts, and black sneakers. A Memphis, Tennessee man is in jail after allegedly stealing money from an 89-year-old woman's bank account. Aaron Cheney has been charged with exploitation of an elderly person, identity theft, fraud use of a credit card and debit card, and theft of property. Cheney withdrew thousands of dollars from an elderly woman's debit card, completing withdrawal transactions at numerous Bank of America ATMs in the area. He made dozens of transactions from her accounts, amounting to $29,000 in fraudulent charges. The Houston, Texas authorities have just released video footage in the hopes of identifying the suspect responsible for the aggravated robbery of an elderly man. The incident occurred on Wednesday, the 26th of May at around 1.20pm, when the pastor arrived at his church, located at a shopping centre at 11,200 block of Beach Nut. Before he arrived at the church, the pastor stopped by his bank in order to withdraw some money, which was placed in an envelope that he had in his front shirt pocket. Then as he approached the front door to the premises, an unknown assailant appeared and grabbed the envelope containing the money from the shirt pocket. The suspect then ran to an older model black Ford or Audi sedan with a dark window tint and fled the scene. The suspect is described as a black male at around 6 feet tall, about 250 pounds, and was wearing a black shirt and black pants. <laughs> 